Good morning. The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee's mission statement is that we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from the government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission statement. Go ahead and roll the President. Well, let's see. You, know, you guys are drawing down $10, $20 million bonuses after America went through the worst economic year that it's gone through in, in decades, and you guys caused the problem? I see reports of massive profits and obscene bonuses at some of the very firms who owe their continued existence to the American people. I did not run for office to be helping out a bunch of uh, you know, fat cat bankers on Wall Street. Even as they're relying on assistance from taxpayers or their company is doing badly, it offends our fundamental values. The only ones that are going to be paying out these fat bonuses uh, are the ones that have now paid back that TARP money. If these companies are in good enough shape to afford massive bonuses, they are surely in good enough shape to afford paying back every penny to taxpayers. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. In March of 2009, reports revealed that after receiving $170 billion taxpayer-funded bailout, AIG, AIG executives had awarded $121 million in bonuses to top executives. As we have just seen, President Obama called this obscene and shameful. He believed that taxpayers should be paid back in full before millions of dollars in bonuses were paid out. Freddie and Fannie have become de facto arms of the government and have received $169 billion from the Treasury Department. To this day, they still owe approximately $141 billion. Despite this outstanding balance, Freddie and Fannie's top six executives received $30 million, $35 million in compensation. Of that, $12.79 million were bonuses awarded to Freddie and Fannie's top ten executives. They have even gone as far as to pay someone a $1.7 million signing bonus. We certainly understand that signing bonus could be partially because they left compensation elsewhere, but we also understand that there are plenty of talented people looking for jobs off Wall Street here today. The signing bonus was given with no uh, correlation to performance, but simply a recruiting tool to finance by the American taxpayers. This bonus, or these bonuses have come just as Freddie and Fannie have asked for an additional $13 billion in handout from the taxpayers. This is, they have reported, a third quarter loss of more than $10 billion. So I think we all understand that we are not paying bonuses for profits. Bonuses under current law to be tax deductible must, in excess of a $1 million compensation, must be tied to performance. Our committee has asked for and received scant documents about performance required. None of the documents received to date would have qualified when I was on the board of a public company for a due diligence by the Compensation Committee. Vague uh, assertions of what one needs to do that can be met simply because you were there does not pass the sniff test. We are here today to ask simple questions on behalf of the American taxpayers. Who is footing the bill for who are footing the bill for Freddie and Fannie? Do you agree with President Obama's sentiments that bonuses should not be paid out to anyone until the American people have been paid back in full? Do you believe in the concept of pay for performance? Do you believe your performance warrants this type of bonus? 
Should you profit, will the taxpayers paying the bill? Are you, or see, are there any measurable standards to even evaluate the performance within the documents we've received, or do you have other documents we've been denied pursuant to our request? Are you any closer to unwinding Freddie and Fannie than you were three years ago? Are these bonuses being awarded for the efforts to minimize losses to taxpayers, or are they payouts, uh, <clears throat> or are they payouts to the four? I won't read the rest of that. Are they, in fact, payouts for other reasons? And if so, whose agenda are they on? Are they on the American taxpayers' agenda, or are they politi political agendas that you're using taxpayer dollars to, rec to, uh, to achieve? Let me make it clear. This committee believes that 2008 law requires you to minimize losses to the taxpayers. Business as usual of simply taking more money from the taxpayers or underwritten by the taxpayers fully and causing an agenda of getting more people into homes they cannot afford, in fact, has not been authorized by Congress. I now recognize the, the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling today's hearing, and thank you for agreeing to my request to invite Mr. DeMarco. Mr. DeMarco and I have been engaged in a series of high-level meetings over the past several months. Some of these meetings have been heated, but others have been very constructive. I appreciate his willingness to appear before us today, and I look forward to our continuing discussions. Executive compensation is a worthwhile topic for this committee to address. In my opinion, we should examine not only the compensation of executives at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but also at Wall Street firms that put the short-term financial interests of their executives ahead of the long-term interests of company shareholders and the public. In reviewing the compensation packages of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac executives, we will have tough questions for our witnesses about how they can claim credit and receive bonuses for achieving performance goals they had nothing to do with, such as supposedly increasing affordability in a housing market that has been tanking for several years. More importantly, we will examine why FHFA, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have done so little to fulfill the key goal of assisting homeowners in need. In 2008, Congress passed the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, and the President signed it on October 3, 2008. The Act states clearly that, among other objectives, FHFA, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac shall implement a plan that seeks to maximize assistance to homeowners. Chairman Issa and I do not agree on much, but we do agree that, to date, efforts to assist homeowners have been woefully inadequate. The Home Affordable Modification Program, HAMP, was supposed to help up to 4 million homeowners modify their loans. But to date, it has helped fewer than 800,000. The Home Affordable Refinance Program, HARP, was supposed to help up to 5 million borrowers refinance at lower rates, but fewer than 900,000 have, re have refinanced to date. Where Chairman Issa and I part ways, however, is how we respond to this problem. The Chairman and other Republicans and even Republican presidential candidates believe we should stop assisting homeowners, abandon efforts to address the housing crisis, and allow millions of additional foreclosures so we can simply hit bottom. I come from a fundamentally different place. I believe that we must redouble our efforts. We need to buckle down and do the hard work necessary to develop solutions that will address this crisis effectively, comprehensively, efficiently, and definitively. It is too easy to throw up our hands and blame the, this entire crisis on individual homeowners who took out loans they could not afford. Those individuals are certainly out there, but there are many more who did absolutely nothing wrong. They paid their mortgages faithfully every month, but now they are underwater through no fault of their own. They owe more on their houses than they are worth, and they cannot sell their homes and they cannot move to a new city for a new job. They are in limbo, along with our, our entire economy. The foreclosure crisis 
does not affect only the individual foreclosed upon. It reduces the value of homes across entire neighborhoods. It lowers taxes, tax revenues for whole municipalities, resulting in the loss of more jobs. It degrades multiple levels of commerce across the country, and it affects each and every one of us, whether we want to admit it or not. Addressing the housing crisis is a key to our economic recovery as a nation. Mark Zandi, the chief economist at Moody's Analytics, agrees. He has stated that housing is ground zero for the economy's problems, high unemployment, and loss of jobs. As Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke recently testified, it will be almost impossible to resolve our economic situation when people are losing their homes at the rate they are losing them. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by returning to the subject of today's hearing. In 2008, Congress and the President passed a law directing FHFA, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, to maximize assistance to homeowners. This has not happened. I believe that we are mired in a culture of mediocrity, and nobody should be receiving million-dollar bonuses by claiming it has. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. All members will have five days to include their opening statements and additional extraneous remarks. We now recognize our, panel of wit our first panel of witnesses. I guess only. Uh, Mr. Michael J. Williams is President and Chief Executive Officer of Fannie Mae. Mr. Charles E. Halderman, Jr. is Chief Executive Officer of Freddie Mac, and Mr. Edward DeMarco is Acting Director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Pursuant to the rules of the committee, I would ask you all to rise to take the oath. Please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. I won't have the heaviest gavel in the world today, but I will tell you that when the green light comes on, you go. Yellow light goes on. Try to summarize, and don't let the red be on too long before we, uh, uh, we, you conclude. And with that, I recognize Mr. Williams for five minutes. Chairman Issa, Ranking Minority Member Cummings, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I apologize, but the mics are very, very point specific. The closer you have it, the better, please. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about the important work that Fannie Mae is undertaking and the compensation program that was put in place for this executive team. Fannie Mae has a dedicated team of talented professionals working to carry out the critical work that the company plays in the housing finance market. We have immense responsibilities. The complexity of the challenges we confront each day requires deep experience and expertise and seasoned leaders. The executive management team in place today is different than the team that ran the company prior to conservatorship. We are working to fix the company and achieve the goals of conservatorship. Our employees are committed to Fannie Mae's mission to provide funding to the market, help struggling homeowners, and reduce losses on loans originated prior to 2009. Fannie Mae is the largest source of funding for the U.S. housing market. Since January of 2009, with the support of the Federal Government, the company has provided more than $2 trillion of funding to the market. The funding has enabled nearly 6 million households to refinance into safer, lower-cost mortgages. We have helped approximately 1.7 million homeowners purchase a home, and we have provided financing for nearly 1 million units of quality, affordable rental housing. Fannie Mae is also acquiring new loans with appropriately conservative underwriting standards to promote sustainable homeownership. The mortgages purchased or guaranteed since 2009 have strong credit quality and are performing well. The new loans account for almost 50 percent of the loans owned or guaranteed by Fannie Mae. These will be a valuable asset that we expect will reduce taxpayer losses. Every day, Fannie Mae employees work to mitigate losses on the company's 2005 through 2008 book of business. This book is significantly affected by continued weakness in the housing and mortgage markets, which remain under pressure from high levels of unemployment and prolonged decline in home prices.
For distressed homeowners, home retention solutions keep families in their homes. We expect this will reduce Fannie Mae's credit losses over the long term. Since 2009, Fannie Mae employees have helped approximately 1 million homeowners avoid foreclosure through modifications and other workout solutions. Unfortunately, foreclosures are not always avoidable. When foreclosure is the only option, we help stabilize communities by properly maintaining and improving properties we acquire and selling them to new owners, giving preference to families who will live in them. Our employees believe in our mission, and we are proud of the work we are doing to, to serve the housing market. However, there is great uncertainty for the company and its employees. As we know, there will be GSE reform, but we don't know when or what form it will take. This uncertainty makes it very difficult to attract and retain employees with highly specialized skills and experience. This is particularly true as other financial institutions can offer long-term career opportunities and, in many cases, substantially more compensation. Attrition at our company this year is already double our historical experience. If we are to continue to provide the stability our housing finance system needs and protect the taxpayers' investment in our company, we must retain and recruit qualified executives and employees. As CEO, I am responsible for ensuring that we effectively manage the resources we have received. To accomplish this, we have employed talented professionals. These employees effectively manage 18 million loans. In 2009, FHFA worked with our leadership, Fannie Mae's board, and the Treasury Department to develop a compensation program for the company. Under this structure, compensation has been substantially reduced from pre-conservatorship levels. Target total compensation for our executive management is down 50 percent or more from levels prior to conservatorship and we have reduced our senior managers at the company by 30 percent. In closing, I am proud of our team and of their dedication to our important work serving the Nation's housing market. Our ability to attract and retain top talent remains a critical priority as we continue to strengthen our business and deliver value to American taxpayers. Thank you, and I look forward to your question. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Halderman. Chairman Issa. Ranking Member Cummings and members of this committee, thank you for inviting me to appear today. My name is Ed Haldeman, and I am CEO of Freddie Mac. I joined Freddie Mac in August 2009, almost a year after the company was placed into conservatorship by the Federal Housing Finance Agency. I welcome the opportunity to be here today to address your questions and concerns about compensation for our executive team. Let me begin by saying I understand why this hearing is necessary. I understand why the American people are outraged about executive compensation in general. I understand totally why Congress and the American people are outraged about executive compensation at companies that have reached, received Federal support including Fannie and Freddie. We have 9 percent unemployment in our country, and there are millions of families at risk of losing their homes. I understand the outrage. How, then, do I reconcile the compensation system at Freddie Mac, given the suffering that so many families are living with? Let me see if I can explain the dilemma I face. My number one objective since taking the job in the summer of 2009 was to keep the company functioning. I concluded that there would be more families hurt and the pain would last longer if there was a breakdown at Freddie Mac. So my focus was on keeping the machinery functioning well in order to do two things. First, provide liquidity to the housing market, and second, help to implement programs that would keep more of our struggling families in their homes. With this guiding philosophy, it seemed to me that gradual change would be preferable to radical change in the operations of the company. 
So here is the strategy we followed with regard to compensation and overall corporate expenses. First, we eliminated some senior executive positions. For example, we no longer have a chief operating officer, which was the second highest paid position in our company. Second, we consolidated some senior executive positions, which allowed us to reduce the number of senior executives. For example, we consolidated the credit and enterprise risk functions at the company. Third, when a senior executive leaves the company, we try hard in every instance to bring in a new executive at a lower compensation than their predecessor. As a result, the 15 highest paid people at our company today receive about the same compensation as the top 15 received a decade ago. Another way to look at the reduction in executive compensation is the reduction from peak levels. The compensation of our senior team is down 40 percent from peak levels pre-conservatorship. While we have sought to achieve major reductions in executive compensation without disrupting the functions of the company, we have put a big emphasis on bringing down overall expenses at our company. Our overall general and administrative spending in the past year is down more than $120 million as compared to our spending levels of 2009. Let me summarize. I understand the reason for this hearing. I understand the outrage. We have significantly reduced executive compensation and overall spending at Freddie Mac, but we have tried to do it in a way that does not risk disrupting the functioning of the company. My belief is that disrupting the functioning of the company would put those families who are suffering at even greater risk of deeper and more prolonged difficulty. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you. Mr. DeMarco. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the Federal Housing Finance Agency's oversight of the executive compensation structure for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, or the enterprises, as I will refer to them. My written statement explains how the enterprise's executive compensation program supports the statutory mandates of the enterprises in conservatorship, how it was developed, and how it is structured. In the few minutes I have, I would like to focus on two matters. First, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have been in conservatorships for more than three years. The draws from the Treasury now exceed $180 billion, reflecting losses from mortgages originated during the years leading up to conservatorship, minimizing those losses as much as possible while maximizing assistance to homeowners is a key focus of FHFA and the enterprises. Since conservatorship, the enterprises have completed more than 1.9 million foreclosure prevention actions, including nearly 1 million permanent loan modifications. While in conservatorship, we are also seeking to ensure the country continues to have a reliable supply of mortgage finance. The enterprises have guaranteed roughly three out of four conforming mortgages since conservatorship. While we await congressional action on the future of housing finance, FHFA has initiated several projects to prepare for the future system of housing finance. These include standards for mortgage servicing, reconsideration of mortgage servicing compensation, and establishing loan level disclosures for mortgage-backed securities. Second, I recognize that there is a great deal of concern today with executive compensation at the enterprises. I would like to make just three observations here. First, the executives most responsible for the poor business decisions that led the enterprises into conservatorship and that led to these taxpayer losses are long gone from the companies. Second, the best way to address concerns with executive compensation is action by Congress to restructure the nation's housing finance system 
and dissolve the conservatorships. Conservatorship is not designed to be a multi-year holding state. Third, as conservator, I need to ensure that the enterprises have people with the skills needed to manage $5 trillion worth of mortgage assets and $1 trillion of annual new business that the American taxpayer is supporting. Others may believe that this sort of talent is easily and quickly hired at compensation far below that of competing private firms, but I do not. Bottom line, this is a question of judgment judgment exercised by balancing the need to limit compensation as much as possible while ensuring stable, continuous operations at the enterprises in support of America's housing finance system. It has been FHFA's judgment that taxpayers who are providing financial support to the enterprises and their guarantees on $5 trillion of mortgages would not be better off if we provoke a rapid turnover of senior management by further slashing compensation. Indeed, such pay cuts would increase the risk of higher losses in the future. Executive compensation was already reduced by 40 percent on average when the compensation program was put into place. I would also note that continued employment in an enterprise risks substantial career uncertainty. By working at Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, your work comes under a much higher degree of scrutiny and criticism than exists at other private firms. Executives who have spent a career developing their reputations risk tarnish to their reputations under the highly charged environment in which these companies operate today. This is true regardless of how well they perform their duties or how great a financial sacrifice they may have made by forsaking other private sector opportunities in order to assist the country's housing finance system. There has been intense criticism launched at corporate executives not even employed by the companies when the bad loans leading to the majority of today's losses were booked, people who arrived after conservatorship to try and make things better. I am trying to encourage these people to stay and continue to mitigate losses and keep the current infrastructure of the country's housing finance system operating. To repeat myself on one point, the only way to finally resolve this question is for Congress to act to end the conservatorships and chart a new course for the country's housing finance system. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward to responding to the committee's questions. Thank you, Mr. DeMarco. I now ask unanimous consent that the salaries of the United States government officials, uh, various officials going from the President of the United States and Vice President down to uh, the, uh, yourself, Mr. DeMarco, Mr. Halderman, and Mr. Williams be admitted in the record, without objection so ordered. Additionally, I would ask unanimous consent that the article of yesterday in Bloomberg Newsweek uh, entitled, Uncle Sam is a Reluctant Landlord of Foreclosed Homes, be placed in the record, without objection so ordered. Last, and definitely not least, I would ask that the committee report be placed in the record without objection, so ordered. I now recognize myself for a first round of questioning. Mr. Williams, you are a career uh, employee, right? You came up through the ranks. And uh, what did you make in 2002, if you recall? What did I make in 2002? Yes, sir. I, I don't know at, off the top of my head. I would have to follow up with you. Give me a year. More than, f more than five years ago, what you made? Again, Congressman, off the top of my head, I don't have that. Pardon. What was your starting pay when you uh, came? Uh, Congressman, I would imagine it was probably around 115000 Yeah, well, Could you speak up Certainly. a little, please? Congressman, I would imagine it was around 115000 when I joined the company over 20 years ago. Okay. So, Twenty years ago, you came with an organization that paid you fifteen thousand dollars, right? One hundred and fifty. One hundred and fifteen thousand. One hundred and fifteen thousand. So they they paid you more then than they paid congressmen. That that hasn't changed. I w I would assume so. But less than the president, he was still making four hundred thousand or two hundred thousand, perhaps back then. Right. Uh, well, let's let's sort of go through the numbers. Mm -hmm. You don't remember what you made ten years ago, but you remember roughly one hundred and fifteen thousand when you started. When did you first make over a million dollars? Everybody, let me rephrase that. I had the luxury of making over a million dollars. I exactly remember 
the year I made over a million dollars. I'm sure you do. What year did you first have compensation, including bonus, that put you over a million dollars? Congressman, I'm not sure when, what year that was. So money is not that important to you? No, money, money is important to all of us who are here today, sir. And it's okay. Important. But you're a career government agency employee. GSC is a government agency, effectively. Congressman, I've been an employee at Fannie Mae for 20 years, serving in a vast array of roles, beginning in technology all the way through to chief operating officer. Okay. Well, I don't want to beat the dead horse, but you came out on 115000 to an organization backed by the government that had a pay scale. Did you ever have an expectation that you were going to uh, make not just seven figures, but several of them, that you would make eight or nine million every two years? Congressman, I think we all hope to aspire to advance in our careers and advance our compensation as we do. Okay. But you made $9.3 million in the last two years. Well, the President made $800,000. You think that's, that's okay? Congressman, I have been brought in and asked to take on this role as CEO so that I can put in place a management team that can help achieve the goals of conservatorship which is stabilize the company, provide liquidity to the market, and help struggle. Okay, but, but you are still losing money. You have taken $90 billion, and you are getting $9 million a year. Uh, let me go on to Mr. Halderman. Now, Bloomberg and other organizations were concerned when you came on board because you don't come with a background like Mr. Williams does. Basically, you are not qualified to run the organization if one were to look at your historic resume. That was a concern. But you did come out of the private sector. Hopefully you remember, what did you make the last year you were at Putnam? I don't, I don't recall. Did you make more than a million dollars? Yes, I did. Was your compensation tied to performance? Yes, it was. Was it tied tightly to performance in which you could literally look at the yields of accounts or the profits of the organization in order to determine what your, perform, what your bonus would be? It was, it was tied to the performance of the funds. It was tied to the economic performance of the company. And I had equity participation as well. Now, equity participation always assumes that the stock goes up, right? It doesn't always, no. It, it happened to during my tenure at uh, So your, your options were worthless if your stock went up or went, went down? That would be correct. Okay. So at, at Freddie Mac, has your stock gone up? In uh, my tenure, it has not gone. Okay. I just want to make sure that uh, $7.8 million over the last two years is based on a company who is not worth more today. As a matter of fact, just for the record, uh, if I were to look at the net profits uh, for Fannie Mae from uh, 2003 to 2010, I would find the net profits were a $10 billion, $11 billion loss. At Freddie Mac, I would find a $72 billion net loss over that same period of nearly a decade. So including the time before you came in, in which the books were being effectively cooked by taking in bad debt uh, that was going to go bad, but in fact putting it on, there were paper profits of $4 and $5 billion, but over that period of time, you are on an organization that certainly lost $14 billion in 2010 and is going to lose equally or more this year. So that is the organization you are running for $4 million a year. Is that right? Yes. We have lost money due to loans that were put on the books during the period 2005 to Okay. My time has expired. I just want to get one last thing in for the record. Mr. DeMarco, from what I can tell, your $230,000 salary is all you get, right? Yes, sir. All I get is my, is my salary. And you do stay for that menial amount of money for some unknown reason, even though you could make money elsewhere? I am still here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DeMarco. Recognize the ranking member. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. DeMarco, uh, you know, I, I, I must tell you, Mr. Alderman and Mr. Williams, you all come from a different world than the one I come from. If I had made a million dollars, I sure would know when I made it, that is for sure. But. Um, Mr. DeMarco, I want to just go to performance, because as I listen to Mr. Williams and Mr. Harlan Alderman, I don't remember hearing the word performance. I may have heard it, but I don't remember hearing it. Um, you said in your testimony that part of the compensation these executives receive is based on their performance. But with all due respect, their performance and yours has been severely deficient, especially in the area of assisting homeowners. 
In 2008, Congress and the President directed you to help homeowners in need. Congress passed the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, and the President signed it on October 3, 2008. The Act states clearly that FHFA, Freddie Mac, and Fannie Mae, and I quote, shall implement a plan that seeks to maximize assistance for homeowners. In your testimony today, you confirmed this is one of your three goals, did you not? I did. Um, but I have uh, seen no plan to do this. Uh, what I have seen is an agency that basically has to be dragged to do uh, its work by the Congress. Now, let's look at performance. HAMP, the Home Affordable Modification Program, was supposed to help three and uh, four million homeowners modify their loans. So far, it has helped fewer than 800,000. Is that true? I believe that is correct for the HAMP program. It is not a correct reflection of the loan modification activity of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So with regard to HARP, the Home Affordable Finance Refinance Program, that was supposed to help uh, between 4 and 5 million borrowers refinance at lower rates. So far, fewer than 900,000 have been refinanced. Is that, is that right? There have been uh, over 900,000 HARP refinances uh, to date, and uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Cummings, from the changes that we have made to that program uh, recently, we are expecting an uptick in that of a meaningful amount. Of course we are, but we are talking about what we have done to date. These gentlemen, they are making this money now, not, 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 not yes, you know, tomorrow. I am talking about today. So I am looking at performance now. Um, Mr. DeMarco, it was not until President, uh, President Obama made an address to Congress on this topic that you started to revamp this program in a serious way. Let's look at uh, HAFA. Uh, just for the record, Mr. Cummings, I actually had directed both companies to work with FHFA on uh, a thorough reexamination of the HAR program several weeks before the President's address. That work was already underway. Okay, so, but you have been, you could have started that a lot earlier, could you not? Uh, we but, did try it uh, last winter, and um, I we made some changes, and I regret that the, well, I don't regret anything. What I, what I would say is that we redoubled our efforts uh, in August, and I'm pleased with the, uh, with the results. Well, Mr. DeMarco, let me tell you, while you may not have any regrets, I have regrets. I have regrets for the people who are uh, being put out of their houses and need help and would like for the goals that were stated to uh, be manifested. And, and that's, that, that I do have regret about, and I understand your lack of regrets, and I am so sorry to hear you have no regrets, because I wish you could face yeah. some of the people who are out of their homes. But uh, Please don't take my words out of context, Mr. Cummings. I did not say that with regard to American homeowners, and I believe that uh, myself and everyone at FHFA and, frankly, the gentleman to my right have been working very hard to provide assistance to American homeowners. And with regard to uh, the quotation from statute that you have cited, it is quite right. I actually cite it myself uh, frequently. But the full quotation includes that we are to undertake this maximizing assistance to homeowners in consideration of the net present value to the taxpayers. And I believe that that makes that what we are doing in terms of uh, providing relief to homeowners consistent with our mandate as conservator to preserve and conserve the assets and property of the company and thereby minimize further losses to the taxpayer. And, it, and, and the mandate is that you shall implement a plan that seeks to maximize assistance for homeowners and use this authority to encourage the servicers of the underlying mortgages and, and, and considering net present value to the taxpayer to take advantage of the HOPE and for homeowners program. Is that not correct? That, 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 that is it, sir. In fact, I think that you raise an excellent point here, and I think it is actually one of the key accomplishments we have had this summer was the servicing alignment initiative that the FHFA organized with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to provide uniform mortgage servicing standards so that servicers would know how to effectively, efficiently, and timely respond to troubled borrowers. And I think we learned from some of the difficulties of the last few years, and we have put in place a, 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 an identical set of servicing requirements that Fannie and Freddie each have for mortgage servicers so that the moment a borrower goes delinquent, the servicers now have clear instructions and positive incentives to make early and robust contact to borrowers to find out what their difficulty is. We are placing a tremendous amount of emphasis on getting 
immediate contact with the borrower and trying to find an appropriate solution to their difficulty, because what we have learned is the faster we do that, the greater the likelihood of success. And I believe that our efforts in this way have been very much consistent with fulfilling the ESA mandate that you quite rightly cite. Mr. Chairman, just real, one, real quick. Um, I ask unanimous consent the gentleman have an additional thank, minute. Thank you very much. Without objection. Thank you. Um, Mr. Marco, I have said this to you before, and as I listen to your defense, and I do consider it a defense, and rightfully so, um, I have said to you, and I begged you, do not mistake a comma for a period. I, mean, I think we can get so caught up in saying what we have achieved that we fail to know that we can do better. And I think that is what troubles me, and that is what troubles many members of Congress. And I say it to you with all sincerity. I am not trying to hurt your feelings or anything like that. But I got to tell you, I am talking, I'm talking about some people who are in pain, I mean big time. And so I, I beg you, do not mistake a comma for a period. I appreciate that, Mr. Cummings. I have benefited from our uh, discussions the last couple months, and um, I, I remain committed to uh, making sure that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in conservatorship are doing all full, robust and appropriate uh, things to be able to help uh, American homeowners that are troubled in their mortgages. And we will continue in that effort. And I am taking uh, under consideration all of the things that you have told me, sir. And I do believe that we share a deep concern for the number of American households that are troubled. And we do share a desire to uh, provide appropriate assistance to them. And we will continue to try to improve our efforts in that way, Mr. Cummings. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. No problem. Thank you. I now ask unanimous consent that the entirety of the Act, uh, H.R. 3221, be placed to the record. And I particularly cite powers of the conservatorship, the agency may, as conservative, take such actions as may be necessary to regulate the entity in a sound and solvent condition and appropriately to carry out the business of the regulated entity and preserve and conserve the assets and properties of the regulated entity. And I believe that is what the gentleman was referring to. With that, we recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Williams, uh, Haldeman, and DeMarco for being here. Um, um, I heard you state that you appreciated us inviting you. Thanks for your, <laughs> your use of words there. I couldn't have said that myself. However, this is a, a, a duty we have to do. Um, uh, Mr. DeMarco, um, the $12.79 million in bonus pay for 10 executives that we are discussing today bonuses that you approved uh, was for providing, and I quote, liquidity, stability, and affordability to the housing market. And my bankers, lenders, financial institutions back at home desire that and would agree with that and would want that to continue. But in light of that, what benchmarks are Fannie and Freddie meeting that would allow such bonuses to kick in? especially in light of the taxpayer losses of approximately $170 billion. Okay. So um, it, this is detailed in the annual uh, securities filings of the two companies, but as uh, I have reported in my, in my written statement, these uh, losses that the taxpayers are absorbing are a result of business decisions made pre-conservatorship and mortgages that were originated pre-conservatorship. And one of the focal points for uh, the uh, executive compensation uh, for the executives of Fannie and Freddie are their efforts to try to minimize losses on that book of business. They can't undo mortgages that are made. But what they can do is that they can take uh, aggressive actions to mitigate those losses through loan modifications and other uh, foreclosure prevention activities. And I report monthly to the uh, um, House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee on the uh, efforts that have been un undertaken uh, to that end and the uh, array of things in which they are assessed and go to efforts to minimize losses, undertake homeowner assistance, ensure that there is ongoing uh, liquidity in the market, and to be working with us on things such as the uh, servicing uh, improvements that I talked about in my exchange with Mr. Cummings. But in light, in light of all that continues on, in light of what, what Mr. Cummings uh, mentioned also about his people, likewise in my State of Michigan, right. um, 
you stated in your opposition uh, you stated your opposition to, uh, yesterday to putting these executives on par with the federal pay scale uh, a position that you continue to uh, suggest today in comments i believe a legislative proposal that was passed out of the house financial services yesterday to do just that why do you oppose that uh, more aggressively I why do why do you oppose that and do you believe Federal agencies cannot perform their duties because they don't offer Wall Street sized paychecks. I, I oppose it simply for the matter that I believe um, enacting that and immediately putting all the employees of Fannie and Freddie on a completely different pay scale is going to result in the taxpayer losses to Fannie and Freddie going up, not down. That is it put simply. Mr. Uh, the Chairman read the excerpt from the HERA legislation regarding conservatorship, an important aspect of that. And what he read <coughs> excuse me, is that I am preserving and conserving the assets of a business entity. I and mean, these remain business entities and they remain regulated entities. They are not government agencies. If the Congress of the United States wants to take action to make them government agencies, make the employees government employees, that is a different story and legal structure than the one that I am being held responsible for overseeing today. What I am being responsible for overseeing today, the way the law works today, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac employees are not government employees. These are not government agencies. They remain private corporations undertaking trillions of dollars of business participating in the marketplace. They continue to be subject not just to FHFA regulation, they continue to be subject to other laws and regulations that apply to similar private I financial institutions, I understand including all of that, the Securities and Exchange Commission rules and so forth. I understand all of that. Our citizens don't. We are tough times, and sometimes very difficult decisions have to be made. And if indeed there is public service, like you indicated, that you want to provide a service, and I think the two gentlemen sitting seated next to you have indicated the same thing, there are challenges we face. Mr. Haldeman, uh, in October you announced that uh, you would be stepping down for, uh, from your position once a successor has been named. That is correct. Uh, did compensation play any role in this decision? No, it did not. Uh, Mr. Williams. Earlier this year, you stated that you would leave it to the FFHA, FH, FHFA to determine what your appropriate compensation would be. If Mr. DeMarco changed course and decided that your compensation should be curtailed, would you be fine with that? Congressman, I would evaluate my own personal options, but that would be the decision of the Board and Director DeMarco. I thank the gentleman. I now ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a study of 2011 compensation uh, done by the uh, Association of Corporate Counsel Southern California Chapter for 2011, and would note that uh, in public companies the compensation in 2011 was approximately $400,000 for general counsels. Well, the general counsels of Fatty, Freddie Mac received $2.9 million and Fannie Mae received $2.6 million, more than four times the compensation that at least the Southern California chapter of general counsels believe is fair. With that, if we go I, to If I may, Mr. Chairman, I think that this is pretty important because of the theme of your, of your uh, hearing here regarding protecting the American taxpayer. So with regard to the legal departments of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, I would like to uh, point out to the committee that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac with FHFA, FHFA taking the lead on this as conservator, has filed lawsuits against 18 of the biggest financial institutions in the country and even in the world to recover uh, losses that we believe are the legal responsibility of others. This is part of our activity to protect the American taxpayer and to carry out our conservatorship responsibility. But I will say, Mr. Chairman, that for us to be able to successfully execute on such complex litigation regarding complex financial transactions and securities, I need to have a qualified um, and experienced uh, Council to be working with us on that. So I believe that this is an investment that we are making that is part of protecting the American taxpayer. And so these are the sorts of things that if we, you know, fundamentally and radically and immediately change the rules of the game with respect to how we perceive Fannie and Freddie, 
we may gain in terms of compensation, but I would like the committee to know that from my perspective as conservator, I believe that we risk other things that could harm the American taxpayer. I know that that is into the Congressman's point over here. I understand that that is uh, uh, hard for the American I, I actually people. don't have any time, and so I don't want to cut you off, but, and I know there will be further dialogue. So I, I certainly will seek time to have this dialogue. But at this time, we recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, one of the things that is interesting about these hearings is that, is that occasionally you get some insight into uh, how people think in a broader sense about those they are supposed to serve. And I have to say that uh, of the witnesses, Mr. Haldeman was the only one who seemed to understand the concerns that the American people have about this issue that faces uh, this committee today. And so I want to thank you for that. Uh, I also want to say that uh, in listening to the testimony, my concern is that there may not be enough sympathy for people who are losing their homes. And if there is a, a gap with tremendous pay being given to people at the top and we don't see enough sympathy for people who are losing their homes, that may mean that you just don't get it. You are too far removed. Now, Mr. DeMarco, on November 1st, your general counsel wrote a letter to Ranking Member Cummings. He disclosed that last year Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac imposed $150 million in penalties against banks for not foreclosing on homeowners fast enough. According to your general counsel's letter, mortgage servicers were charged daily fees by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac if they failed to process foreclosures within set deadlines. Here is what your general counsel wrote. Quote, to date, the top ten servicers account for the bulk of the fees due. The total amount for all servicers after approving appeals and corrections is approximately $150 million for 2010. And this is stunning. With all the abuses going on with robo-signing and the filing of false court documents, Fannie and Freddie were charging massive fees against banks that failed to expedite foreclosures. Mr. DeMarco, were you aware of these penalties? Uh, I am aware of them, Congressman, and I can explain them. Um, these penalties are a result of the failure of mortgage servicers to perform under their servicing contracts with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in a way that are driving up costs to the American taxpayer. These, uh, the servicers are under contractual obligations to Fannie and Freddie to mitigate losses. And in my exchange with Mr. Cummings earlier, I went into some detail about the effort we have undertaken to ensure that servicers are reaching out to troubled borrowers from the moment there is well, evidence well, they are being troubled. There is a point here that you are missing, and that is there was an Inspector General finding, you are familiar with it, that FHFA, quote, directed Fannie Mae to impose compensatory fees against the servicers for violating foreclosure timeline limits. Now, is that true? And did you actually direct Fannie or Freddie to impose those penalties in 2010? It is true, Congressman, because it is driving up the cost of the American taxpayer. So you were aware of the abuses going on, but you failed to address them in a timely manner? That is what the Inspector are, General reported. With all due respect, Congressman, these are two different issues. And the compensatory fees that have been assessed have been done so with recognition and allowance for uh, the delays in foreclosure processing, either due to assisting the borrowers to try to find a foreclosure alternative or because of foreclosure delays that have been, uh, been driven by uh, things external to the servicers' uh, 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 control. Well, this IG report concluded that, quote, there were multiple indicators of foreclosure risk, uh, abuse risk prior to 2010 that could have led FHFA to identify and act earlier on the issue, including, quote, consumer complaints alleging improper foreclosures, contemporaneous media, media reports about foreclosure abuses by Fannie Mae's law firms, and public court filings in Florida and elsewhere highlighting such abuses. Now, Mr. DeMarco, if you were aware of these abuses, why would you order hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties to try to speed up the process even further? Why would you do that? I would like to again try to separate the abuses and the corrections that have been undertaken with regard to them with servicers not performing uh, adequately in 
foreclosing on properties that have gone multiple years without any payment because this is driving up the cost to the taxpayer. The longer we, we, we are foreclosing on properties that have had no payments for two, three years or more, and all this time the American taxpayer is funding those mortgages. And it is also damaging local communities and it is damaging housing markets to have these properties sitting there with no action being taken against them. Congressman, with all due respect, I believe that well, this is Well, with all due respect thing. to you, sir, there was a, the IG report talked about uh, supporting personnel overloaded with the volume of foreclosures, documentation problems were evident, they said. You haven't disputed that. This is Members of the committee, what you have here is a situation where they are focusing on accelerating foreclosures Gentlemen's and hurting our constituents. I am from Cleveland. We have more foreclosures there than most expired. areas. Gentlemen's time has, has expired. Uh, Mr. Walsh of Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being with us here today. A um, couple quick points and then, and then an overall question. Uh, we talk in trillions, billions, and millions around here. We are 50. $15 trillion in debt. Um, Fannie and Freddie have been subsidized to the tune of about $170 billion the last three years. Uh, executive compensation last year in, in 2009 and 2010 was about $35 million. Um, big numbers, they jump out. Just quickly, uh, a, a small, two smaller numbers jumped out at me. Fannie and Freddie paid outside compensation consultants $655,000 in 08 and $560,000 in 09 to determine their own pay structure. We paid outside consultants that much money to determine the pay structure. Does that sound right, Mr. Williams and Mr. Haldan, Haldman? Does that Con sound excessive? Congressman, we hired the company and the board of directors hired compensation consultants to help them structure a compensation program for men. A little closer. Congressman, the board of directors hired compensation consultants to work with them to develop a compensation program at the request of FHFA, and, that, and they worked in partnership with FHFA and the Treasury Department to develop that compensation $655,000 in one year to help you determine your pay structure. Mr. Haldeman, does that sound excessive? It, it sounds like a lot of money, but there are compensation consultants that are required uh, for the board in addition to the company's compensation consultant. So I think that number would include four yeah. consultants, if I get it right, because I think you were pointing out for both enterprises, okay. so that would be four in total. Okay. But I agree it is a lot of money. And, and one other quick point. On your testimony, Mr. Haldeman, you said that the 15 highest executives today are paid the same as, roughly the same as the top five a decade ago. I, 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 I don't know that that is something to rave about. I mean, James Johnson, 91 to 98, earned $100 million in pay with the company. Franklin Raines, we remember that name, 99 to 05, earned more than $90 million from 98 to 03. Uh, Daniel Mudd earned $12 million in 05. I, I don't know that it furthers our, our topic here to compare what we are doing today with what executives made 15 years ago. Mr. Haldeman, I, I, I appreciate the tone you took, that you understand the outrage certainly that Congress feels, and, and in, in, in theory and in practice we reflect the outrage that is out there. Um, but understand something. Many, many members of Congress uh, came here because this country is broke. Big freshman class of Republican and Democrats, who, who most of whom left probably much higher paying positions to come here and serve this country because this country is broke. Uh, I'm not unusual. There are other members like myself who came here and it turned down my health benefits, turned down any pension benefits, because we've all got to do something pretty quickly uh, or we're going to be in a heap of trouble, and future generations are going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, so I, I appreciate that you understand the outrage, but are you telling me that, that unlike Congress and, and some other departments in government, 
we are fundamentally not able to find people who need to do what they need to do at Fannie and Freddie for less than the amount of money in base pay and bonuses that we are paying folks? And if so, do you understand how a lot of people might find that hard to believe? I, uh, first of all, I uh, think all of us appreciate the public service of the entire Congress and realize that many have made a personal sacrifice to take on those roles. And I commend uh, uh, Acting Director DeMarco for the public service that he's uh, given the country. And there are many examples of people who have done that. The dilemma I face, maybe I can bring the numbers down a little bit in size. One of the important functions we perform at Freddie Mac is managing an investment portfolio. When I took over my job in August of 2009, that investment portfolio was $900 billion. We have brought it down continuously. It is now about $680 billion in size. There are people who are managing that portfolio. What I worry about is if they make a 1 percent mistake, that costs the taxpayer $6.8 billion. If they make a one-tenth of one percent mistake, it is $680 million. And the people that are required to effectively manage that money and that, that investment portfolio and not make those mistakes are highly skilled, sophisticated, seasoned people that have many, many opportunities for high-paying jobs. And we need some of them at Freddie Mac to make sure we don't make those mistakes. That is the dilemma. Thank you, Mr. And Chairman. Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, change tax here a little bit if I can. Mr. DeMarco, I, I want to ask you about principal reductions. That will be no surprise to you coming from our many previous discussions. But at first I want to share with you some comments. Uh, Neil Abrovsky, who is the former Special Inspector General for the TARP program, I quote him, there needs to be a recognition that many borrowers will never make the required payments on their underwater mortgages, and that the owners of these mortgages have already lost any meaningful chance of obtaining a full recovery of the outstanding principal. The sooner that this reality is recognized and addressed, the sooner a recovery can take hold. As such, an aggressive principal reduction program is necessary. Alan Binder, the former Vice Chair of the Federal Reserve Act, said most economists see principal reductions as central to preventing foreclosures. Ben Bernanke, the Federal Reserve Chairman, said in this environment, principal reductions that restore some equity for the homeowner may be a relatively more effective means of avoiding delinquency and foreclosure. Mark Zandi, Chief Economist for Moody's Analytics, the weaker than anticipated housing market poses a serious threat to the economic expansion. He suggests a policy step with one of the best odds of ending the housing crash quickly and definitively would have the government facilitate loan modifications with substantial principal write-downs. Now, when Congress passed the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, we directed FHFA, Freddie and Fannie to implement a plan that seeks to maximize the system for, for homeowners. We have been through the language on that, but it does talk about uh, taking, having the mortgage services, encouraging services to take advantage of programs to minimize foreclosures. There is nothing in the law, and we have shared this before, that I see or that anybody else advises sees that it prevents you from approving a program to reduce principal if it is in the taxpayer's interest. Now, Fannie Mae's second quarter credit supplement says the average return to Fannie Mae this year on foreclosed properties is 55 percent of unpaid principal balance. So you are going to lose 45 percent of any foreclosed property. And if that is the case, but you would only lose 5 percent, say, of a principal reduction program, why not reduce the principal and keep the borrower in his or her home? Uh, we have been through the analytics of the underwater borrowers at Fannie and Freddie and looked at the alternative uh, foreclosure alternative uh, programs that are available, Mr. Turney, and we have concluded that the use of a principal reduction within the context of a loan modification is not going to be the least cost approach for the taxpayer to allow this homeowner an opportunity to stay in their home. We are using aggressively loan modification activities that include principal forbearance, which will uh, zero out the interest rate charged on the underwater portion of the mortgage without forgiving the debt of the mortgage. And this is all designed to get the borrower into an affordable monthly payment so that they can continue in their home. And that has been the basic calculus that has uh, 
guided this decision. As I have said before, I do not believe that I have been appropriated taxpayer funds for the purpose of providing this more general support to the housing market. Um, we are supposed to undertake our loss mitigation activities with regard to the to cost to the taxpayer. But you have been empowered as conservators to have the fiduciary responsibility of maximizing the value of the taxpayer's assets. And if it is less costly, to modify the principal and modify the loan than it is to go to foreclosure, I would think you would be breaking that fiduciary responsibility. What you are telling me flies in, flies in the face of Neil Borowski, Alan Blinder, Ben Bernanke, Mark Zant, Sandy, and all these people. You just come up with a different idea, and maybe you would share with us your calculations so we could run it by some of these other people who see it quite differently than you do. Several of the banks are already doing principal reductions right now. Uh, you have an example of Aquan, which is a program under the, the, where the service, servicer reduces the loans to 95 percent of the homeowner's fair market value. The excess principal is forgiven over three years as long as the homeowner remains current. When the home is sold or refinanced, the borrower is required to pay 25 percent of the appreciated value uh, and share that with Aquan. According to the company's CEO, shared appreciation modifications help homeowners avoid foreclosure and restore equity, providing a significant benefit to the customer, the economy, and the housing market. Now, they are not doing that to be nice. You know that. It is in their financial self-interest, and I still don't think you made a compelling argument why it is not in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the taxpayers' financial self-interest to do that. J.P. Morgan Chase is doing it, Ally Financial, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. They have reduced an average of $51,000 off the balance of about 73,000 borrowers in 2009 and 2010. Is everybody else wrong, Mr. DeMarco, and, and FHFA is right in this? I believe, uh, Congressman, I believe that the decisions that we have made with regard to principal forgiveness are consistent with our statutory mandate. I do believe we are taking all due effort to provide assistance to homeowners, and I do not believe I have been authorized to use taxpayer money for a general program of principal forgiveness. Mr. Chairman, if I would just uh, be a unanimous consent for 30 more seconds. Mr. DeMarco, I would like you to do two things for the committee, if you would. Okay. First, I want you to identify anywhere in the statute that specifically prohibits you from developing principal reduction programs, uh, because as I read the law, you don't have the authority to do that. So if you would do that and then share that with the committee and me. Second, I would like you to submit whatever analysis uh, you have done that shows why reducing the principal of some mortgages is worse for the United States for, uh, taxpayer than foreclosure. If you provide that analysis that you talked about, I would appreciate it. Will you do that for us? We can, uh, we can provide the information the, as you suggested, Congressman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Farenhold from uh, Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, Mr. Halderman. Uh, I would like to start uh, my questions with you. A lot of your, comp a lot of your discuss first off, I want to commend you for being here. If I were taking a salary like you guys were in these times, I would be real reluctant to be up and facing the people. I, I admire you for, uh, for taking the heat on this. But l l let me ask you a, a question. You compare your salaries uh, in justifying them to those making in, made in private sector uh, companies. Uh, in, in those private sector uh, companies, very often the compensation package is based on uh, very specific design results and the performance of the company, and uh, you are but you basically serve at the pleasure of the shareholders through the board of directors. And Freddie and uh, and Fannie, you guys basically are are, are serving uh, the taxpayers. We've invested a whole lot of money in uh, in your company, and really this committee is about the only and in Congress is about the total level of oversight we have. And what I've heard from uh, people back home is a, is a pretty consistent. Wow, you know, wh why are you taking uh, this much money as performing uh, uh, so poorly and having to come back? And I've heard today that you said, well, it would be doing worse if we weren't uh, if we weren't doing what we do. So let me ask you this: uh, If you know, would you would you all invest in Freddie and Fannie? Would you put your own money uh, in that and expect to see a return or to see it level out? And uh, I guess we'll start with Mr. Williams. Congressman, let me, let me start with a few points. Uh, first of all, as we have all, to your, to your comments, the losses that we have been incurring are due to the loans that were booked prior to 2009. Secondly, the management team that we have brought in is a new management team to deal with the challenges that we are facing and the specific issues that we have been asked to serve as conservator. Stabilize the company, to provide the necessary liquidity and support to the market, 
ensure there is an adequate supply of affordable rental housing, and help distressed homeowners wherever we can. Now, okay, we, but I, I understand. But you, you started in this company 20 years ago at a, at, at, I think you testified earlier, at well over $100,000. So, I mean, you have been there through this. Where were you kicking and screaming? I, I, again, tell me if you were, because I, I don't know. Where were you kicking and screaming and say, hey, we are about to get in a lot of trouble? Congressman, I am happy to discuss my role prior to conservatorship. So as prior to cons in the years leading up to conservatorship, I served as the chief operating officer of the company. I was responsible for managing our regulatory agreements that were put in place prior to conservatorship and making sure we achieved all the objectives under that. I was responsible for leading the company's efforts to restate our financial statements and get current with the SEC's filings, which we did all that. And I led the companies. Uh, I led the oversaw the company's areas such as technology, uh, human resources, as well as our. I mean, back but from an executive level, didn't you have to see some of this coming, Congressman? In hindsight, I'm sure we all wish that we could have made different decisions back in that time. Yeah, well, all right. Well, let me just ask one more question. Now, I, I think it would be fair to say that there are a lot of people who take jobs for less money than they would make in, in, in other jobs for reasons beyond compensation. I mean, you take the President. I mean, you may, doesn't pay all that well. The Supreme Court uh, doesn't pay nearly what a good lawyer can make in the private sector. And, Certainly our teachers, who are underpaid throughout this country, take jobs for reasons, uh, reasons beyond uh, compensation. And you look in the private sector, and uh, Vikram Pandit of uh, Citigroup says he is not going to take any compensation until the company turns a profit. Uh, I mean, do, don't you think we could get qualified people to do your jobs and the jobs of those other senior executives without having to pay m millions of dollars? Congressman, I'm, ha I'm happy to address that question because, uh, first of all, as I noted, this is a new team. We have reduced executive compensation by 50 percent. We have reduced the number of senior executives by 30 percent. But I can tell you, are, are these jobs competitive? Yes. In the course of three months, I lost five senior vice presidents out of the company to financial services and other companies where I can assure you they were making more money and had better career prospects as a result. These are challenging jobs in challenging circumstances, and we need to pay and reward the people who are doing the jobs. Well, I see that my time is, is about to expire, and I, I apologize for not getting to uh, you, Mr. Halderman. Thank you. Mr. Davis of Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DeMarco, let me ask, when you announced these compensation packages in 2009, you issued a press release explaining that these million-dollar salaries were necessary to, and I quote, to attract and retain the talent needed, end of the quote, for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to perform their roles. In a recent letter to Congress, you wrote that you were also concerned about a rapid turnover of management and staff replaced with people lacking the institutional, technical, operational, and risk management knowledge requisite to the running of corporations with thousands of employees and more than $2 trillion in financial obligations. Let me ask, what kind of analysis did you do prior to making these conclusions? Did you survey the current staff that, that was present? And do you have some kind of document that you could share with us that would demonstrate the potential effects of lower salaries on the workforce, on the agencies, and ultimately on the homeowners who had mortgages to pay? Uh, Congressman, with regard to the uh, announcements of the pay structure that were, took place in 2009, the uh, background for that was developed uh, over the course of time uh, by my predecessor. And then when I became acting director, um, I uh, assumed the completion of that work. It was done in a consultation with other government agencies. It was done in consultation with um, uh, pay consultants. It was done in a lot of consultation with the special master for compensation at the Treasury Department to assess what was the market like for compensation in troubled 
but large and complex financial institutions and what was the right structure and balance to weigh between the need to have competent, skilled professionals running these complex financial institutions against market conditions at the time um, and the, uh, the market opportunities that they had. That was all part of the determinations that went into the announcement in 2009. Well, let me ask Since you, then, let, it, let, me, let me just ask you, because mm -hmm. time is going to expire. Uh, earlier this year, the Inspector General for the Federal Housing Finance Agency issued a report evaluating your oversight of executive compensation at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. The IG report stated that, and I am quoting again, that you never seriously considered, end of quote, comparing compensation at Fannie and Freddie to compensation at other housing agencies. Is that true? We did not consider the FHA commissioner or the head of Ginnie Mae to be market comparables to private companies that operated with all the liabilities and responsibilities of a private company. We are certainly, being government employees, are well aware of the compensation that those, uh, that those executives have. So you are saying that you did not make a comparative analysis of other housing agencies that might have some of the same responsibility, although certainly not as much and, and certainly not of exactly the same type. That is right. I am saying that we did not find that to be a, to be a comparable to two private companies that were operating in the marketplace with all the legal responsibilities and liabilities of private complex financial institutions. Do you think that the Federal Housing Administration, Jenny May and, and, and other agencies who seemingly were doing much better uh, did not take into consideration the same factors and the same market and the overall conditions of the economic climate? Well, in fact, I am not sure I followed the question, but certainly um, you know, government employees have a, a completely different set of, of, of benefits and, frankly, personal liabilities or lack thereof when it comes to uh, their engagement. And I do believe and I have a great deal of respect for people that come into political positions in government. They take a, a a huge cut in compensation for the opportunity to be direct players in assisting the country and in guiding policy making in the country. These are, these are uh, temporary positions that they fill before going back out into the private sector. And I do believe that the leadership of a company that has got $2 trillion worth of obligations needs to have Bottom line, people. Bottom line, you think that the salaries are necessary? and we couldn't do it any other way. I believe that what we have in place, sir, is what is the best to minimize the losses to the taxpayer in terms of the overall uh, situation that we have as long as Fannie and Freddie are in conservatorship. And it's why I said in my written statement and oral remarks, I really wish that we could have the administration and the Congress of the United States get together and come up with legislation that will bring these conservatorships to, uh, to an end and to build an appropriate uh, housing finance system Thank for the future. Much. I thank my colleague. Uh, Mr. Burton, for five minutes. Well, first of all, uh, let me just say that uh, the problem started in 1994 when you loosened up, and you weren't here, none of you were here, when we loosened up the underwriting standards to give loans to people who cannot afford to make the payments is crazy. I was an underwriter for an insurance company for a long time, and I know how that system works. You just don't do it. And it's not rocket science. The minute you give a loan to somebody who doesn't have the capability to make the payments, then they, you, 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 you created a mess that is inevitably going to end in disaster. And that's what you inherited. Now, you, Mr. Williams, were there for 20 years. I, I don't know how you didn't see part of this, but nevertheless, uh, the, the problem was pretty apparent to somebody that has any idea how finances work. Let me, let me just uh, ask a couple of questions. Uh, you had an outside entity make a recommendation on compensation, and then you as conservator, Mr. DeMarco, made a recommendation to the board, and that was pretty much approved. Is that the way it works? 
Uh, I had responsibility for the final decision, Mr. Burton. So you made the decision on compensation? Ultimately. This work was well underway before I became acting I know, director, but, but uh, ultimately, you yes. Were the one. Well, I, we talked a little bit about this before. Uh, for legal counsel, for public companies, and I heard what you said about the expertise of these guys, the two, 2010 salary for public companies was averaging about $266,000, and with a bonus, it was about 104,000, so it was around 400,000. For a private company, the salary was 204,000, and the bonus was around 100,000. Now, under Freddie Mac, Robert Bostrom, the general counsel, got 2.9 million in 2010, and Timothy Mayopoulos, the general counsel, got 2.6 million in total compensation in 2010. I, don't, I understand that they had the expertise, and I understand they had to have a good staff in order to make sure that the litigation was processed and pursued in a, in a very rapid way, but that just seems very excessive to me. And, and Mr. Williams and Mr. Haldeman, I am sure, are competent in, in many ways. I don't have the time nor the inclination to go into their qualifications. But when you look at the salaries and you realize the problems that the country faces, it is just excessive. I don't think anybody that looks at this would, would disagree with that. And I am very disappointed. Then you talk about uh, being uh, very cognizant of the taxpayers' money. Uh, I am very disappointed that this kind of pay is being given with the bonuses and everything when it is far in excess of, uh, of, uh, of the private sector in most cases. And, 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 and you inherited a lot of the problem. Don't misunderstand. I understand that. And the underwriting was terrible before. And I don't know how in the world we are going to get out of this quagmire, but the fact of the matter is it is excessive, and I think it needs to be corrected. Uh, we have to have competent people. We have to make sure we have competent people that can do the job. But I think that when you start giving these salaries out to these people, you have to make absolutely sure you are not being excessive. And, Mr. DeMarco, uh, I'm sure you're trying to do the job to the best of your ability, but I hope you'll try a little bit harder as long as you're the conservator. And, and if you have recommendations on what Congress can do to help deal with this problem, I'd sure like to see it. I'd like to see uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, be done away with and go back to the private market where sound business principles are applied to make sure that qualified people are buying these houses instead of trying to help everybody out, especially those who can't afford them. You just dig a bigger and bigger hole, and that's why this country is in the mess that it is right now. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, from, chair from former chairman to former chairman, Mr. Towns is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by saying that uh, I, I want to, you to help me to be able to determine in terms of how you arrive at these bonuses. You know, I, I know that. Um, in education, if you are able to lower the dropout rate, teachers are able to um, uh, improve the reading scores, um, have great retention in terms of students uh, graduating on time or staying in school, uh, and then based on that, then the teacher gets a bonus, and um, which in I think that makes sense. They have done something outstanding. Now they are rewarded. Tell me how you arrive at the bonuses, Mr. DeMarco. For, uh... So uh, FHFA, in consultation with the boards of directors of each company, <clears throat> developed um, corporate scorecards for each company outlining an array of areas of uh, performance regarding minimizing losses to the taxpayer, remediating operational and risk management weaknesses of the company, and ensuring that the businesses operated uh, effectively and efficiently. So there was an array of items that were put into the corporate scorecard. These are then reviewed by, <coughs> scored by management at the end of the year, reviewed by internal audit of the companies, then reviewed by the board of directors, and finally by my staff in terms of assessing the performance. And that becomes a key input into the determination of these bonuses. The structure for the employee's compensation, the executive compensation, it has um, the following components. We set a target compensation for each executive that is aligned to be at or below the median of a comparable position in a comparable firm. 
And from that target compensation, a third of it is set aside to be paid in the form of a target incentive opportunity, or what you all would refer to as a bonus. And that gets paid out over a two-year period after the performance year. Then the rest is salary. A portion of it is paid during the course of the year. The majority of it is held off as deferred salary to be paid the following year, and that is done for retention purposes. And furthermore, to incentivize uh, performance there, a portion of that deferred salary is itself tied to the corporate performance, allowing for a reduction in the actual amount of deferred salary that is paid if performance doesn't, uh, doesn't measure up. As is detailed in my written statement, in each of the years we have done these assessments, we have not awarded full amounts for, these, uh, for either the deferred salary or for the uh, target incentive opportunities. We have awarded less than, the, less than the targeted amounts. Let me just say that uh, um, you know, uh, I noticed in terms of my good friend and colleague, uh, uh, Congressman Burton, indicated, in fact, in terms of the, what happened in terms of 1994. But I think there is one thing that we are not considering, is the fact that in many families, one person has lost his or her job, and that has created uh, uh, a lot of problems along the way. And when I walk the streets in my district and I listen to the people that are losing their homes, you know, and then you look at these salaries, and one would say, "Wait a minute! Why don't we take these salaries and save a whole block?" You know, uh, uh, and, and this is what you're hearing from people, mm -hmm. you know, back in the district that I represent in Brooklyn, New York. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, do you hear people talking about excessive salaries? Uh, I do. I get uh, I get correspondence on this as well. I certainly hear from uh, members of Congress and so forth. And all I can uh, say, Congressman, is I believe that we are trying to strike a difficult balance between ensuring that these multi-trillion dollar companies have their appropriate expertise running them and that we are keeping these salaries as low as possible to make while ensuring that we have got capable people and that the people that are there from the CEOs on down are focused on helping helping homeowners. We are very committed to trying to uh, help troubled homeowners but, and to provide alternatives to them when they get in trouble. Successful, if we are not successful, I am not sure whether we should. No. Let me just ask one quick one before my time has expired. The IG uh, report concluded that uh, your agency failed to act on foreclosure abuse issues until the middle of 2010, even though there were multiple indicators prior to that time which would have led you to act earlier. Are you familiar with, with this report? I am. Uh, let me ask you about one of the foreclosure firms, the law firm of Stephen J. Bombs in New York. Over the past week, both Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae instructed services not to refer any new foreclosures uh, cases to the firm. Why did Freddie and Fannie just now drop this law firm? Why did it take so long? I just want to find out from as to why. Yes, please. Why did it take so long, Mr. Uh, Williams? Yeah. Congressman, we are constantly looking at our law firms and we find when they are not performing, or in this case, uh, I concur with your concern about their, their behavior, we take action as quickly as possible. It is also important for us to prudently move the cases so that we don't incur additional losses to the taxpayer. And that should be considered in your valuation as well to determine whether the person gets that extra compensation. Thank you. I thank the former chairman. I recognize Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield back my time to the chair. Well, thank you. I certainly appreciate the gentleman yielding. Um, now, Mr. DeMarco, I'm, I know you are familiar with the Office of Inspector General. But to Mr. Williams, uh, because of your service in government, Mr. DeMarco, I, I know you are very familiar with that process. But Mr. Williams, Mr. Haldeman, are you both aware that uh, Federal IGs have the uh, right to request information and assistance from their regulated entities? Yes, I am. I am aware as well. Yes. Now, it was brought to the Committee's attention that employees uh, at the enterprises have resisted document requests made by the FHFA Office, Office of Inspector General, arguing said that these requests must go through the FHFA. Uh, were you aware of this, Mr. Williams? Congressman, we are fully cooperating with the IG on all matters and coordinating with FHFA. 
it was my understanding that we were cooperating uh, with any requests from the IG and coordinating it with um, our counterparts at FHFA. Okay. Uh, will you both commit to full compliance with all requests of information from the Office of the Inspector General? Mr. Williams? Congressman, we work with the IG cooperatively. Will you commit? It is a, it's a question, and I understand you want to give a different answer, but will you commit to providing the documents and information the Office of Inspector General requests of your entity? We have been, Congressman, and we will continue to do so. You will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Mr. Haldeman? Yes. With the only caveat I would add is that we do coordinate that activity with our regulator, FHFA. Okay. So, the, uh, it, to, so to, to, be, to be clear, so to you, Mr. DeMarco, um, so the oversight, the Office of Inspector General, who is to oversee you, they must request from you in order to request from the entities that you are regulating in order to get information? The IG's responsibility is to oversee the economy and efficiency and effectiveness of FHFA, and, we, uh, and that is done to get the effect right. of some of FHFA's activities. They uh, will request information from the regulated entities, and I believe we would worked out a uh, you know, very efficient process for dealing with that, and I believe both companies have been responsive to the IG. But the IG's oversight is of FHFA. FHFA's right, but, oversight is of But in order to get that information, for instance, the TARP oversight, uh, Office of Inspector General requests information of the banks that got money, and they don't have right. to go to the Treasury in order to ask for that. Right. So it's not being. I don't believe it's you, being passed through. Would you through. commit to letting the FHA, uh, I mean, the Office of Inspector General, directly request of Fannie and Freddie the documents and information that they need, pursuant to uh, to audits and evaluations being undertaken by the IG? Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll, uh, and with that, I'd like to yield the balance of uh, the time uh, back to uh, Dr. Desjardins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for appearing before us today. Mm -hmm. uh, the title of our hearing today, as you well know, is uh, Pay, for Perform Pay for Performance Should Fannie and Freddie Executives Be Receiving Millions in Bonuses? So uh, just with the little time we have, I will go to each of you and, and let you answer that question directly. Mr. Will Mr. Williams. Yes, Congressman. Should we be paying? for performance, yes, we should, and are we being evaluated on the performance of the executives? Yes, we are. And we have been given some very complex challenges to deal with in this market. Okay. Mr. Haldeman? Yes, we should be paid based on performance. Um, the difficulty is that, um, in contrast to my years in the private sector, and where all the companies uh, were profitable, um, and it was uh, easy, easier but to identify performance and tie it to profitability, much more difficult uh, to tie pay to performance in the kind of situation we have at Freddie Mac, where there are so, so many embedded losses that we are dealing with that continue to throw, uh, uh, come through the, the financial statements. Okay. And again, the, the title, Pay for Performance, Should Fannie and Freddie Executives Be Receiving Millions in Bonuses, uh, Mr. DeMarco? Uh, Let us address the millions in bonuses. I believe they should be being compensated at, uh, at a market rate that allows FHFA as conservator to ensure that we can attract and retain suitable executives to run these companies. Thank that's you. I will have some more questions in a minute. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, the witnesses have testified that part of their compensation is based on how Fannie and Freddie perform. Uh, but I have serious questions about some of their so-called achievements. Uh, let me give you an example. Fannie Mae's 10-K filing states that credit losses were actually lower than expected in 2010. That sounds like good news. However, the reason for these lower credit losses is that many services were caught up in the robo-signing scandal and were forced to halt their foreclosures during the fourth quarter of 2010. Uh, Mr. DeMarco, 
uh, how can you take credit for fewer losses if they resulted from the robo-signing scandal? Uh, and, and, and that's not a basis for right. bonus, is it? Congressman, the, the, the performance uh, over the last year that was better than FHFA itself had projected in a, in a published report in October of 2010 is reflective only in part by delays in foreclosure. It in fact reflects that we have had a better performance of underwater mortgages than had been projected. We have had a better performance of loan modifications and other foreclosure alternatives than had been projected. And so, in fact, I think that it is reflective of the fact that the steps that have been taken at these companies are actually bearing fruit and have resulted in performance that was better than was modeled and publicly reported in projections by FHFA last year. Okay. Let me uh, give you another example. Part of the executive compensation was based on this factor, whether Fannie Mae was able to issue at least 37.5 percent of all new mortgage-backed security issuances. According to Fannie Mae, they exceeded this goal. However, as the IG pointed out, the main purchaser was the government. In a report issued earlier this year, the IG said this, it seems unlikely that Fannie Mae could have commanded such a large share of the market without the Federal Reserve's purchase of its MBS. Uh, Mr. DeMarco, you can't really take credit for meeting this goal if it was due to deliberate support from the Federal Reserve, can you? These were not coordinated actions, Congressman. The Federal Reserve's um, purchase of mortgage-backed securities was designed to affect uh, mortgage interest rates and, and, and rates in the marketplace. Um, these, are, these are separate things. Okay. Let me ask you about another example. One of the measures for determining performance bonuses for Freddie and Fannie executives was whether they provided more affordability to the housing market. They claimed they met this goal, arguing that affordability has improved dramatically. Well, do you know why? Because housing prices have tanked. Now, Mr. DeMarco, are you seriously paying millions of dollar bonuses for achievements in this area? Uh, that particular element, sir, is reflective of the company's responsibility uh, for meeting some various affordable housing goals. And not, without regard to the fact that they are in conservatorship, they remain subject to these kinds of responsibilities, and that is what they were being uh, looked at, to make sure that in conservatorship they weren't stepping back from uh, certain parts of the market, including those that are generally referred to as the affordable housing sector in the marketplace. It was designed to make sure that they stayed active in purchasing mortgages in all parts of the uh, marketplace. Okay, so that was the benchmark, affordability. And, uh, but are you actually awarding bonuses because housing prices are continuing to plummet? No, sir. Okay, what is the benchmark then? The benchmark is the housing goals that they are in place and that we report on to the Congress. You know, I am mystified as to why these so-called achievements should entitle executives to million-dollar bonuses. And, and they either had nothing to do with the actions of Fannie and Freddie or they appeared to, to reward a continuing downward spiral in our housing market. I can't figure out which one it is. Can you help me? Um, Congressman, I, I appreciate how difficult this is. Um, clearly, we are all frustrated by the conditions in the country's housing market and its economy. We are trying, as conservator Fannie and Freddie, to ensure that those companies remain active in the marketplace so that the country has a functioning secondary mortgage market, to make sure that they are taking all appropriate action to assist borrowers in troubled mortgages, and that the $5 trillion worth of mortgages that the American taxpayer is now supporting are being uh, overseen and managed by competent professionals that can um, prudently manage the risk of such an enormous portfolio. 
Um, as I said at the outset and in my written statement, it is not our goal to be keeping this going, and I really would welcome working with the Congress of the United States to get on with the hard work of housing finance reform so that we can bring the conservatorships themselves to an end, which would end this compensation issue and the much larger exposure of the taxpayer. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, I would encourage you to also work with the President on housing finance reform. Dr. Desjardins from Tennessee is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, you are CEO of Fannie Mae, correct? Correct, sir. Okay. Uh, do you think that uh, Fannie Mae is a success? It's, uh, uh, the enterprise is, is uh, succeeding, doing well. Congressman, uh, we have been given some very challenging goals, as I have articulated. We have needed to stabilize the company, to provide critical support to the marketplace as we have provided our liquidity and funding for both single family and multifamily, while helping to reduce long term credit losses. And helping struggle. Is it meeting your expectations as the CEO? I think the team has done an extraordinary job under very difficult circumstances, sir. Okay. And, Mr. Haldeman, as far as Freddie Mac, you are the CEO. Do you think it is a success? Are you proud of the company? Do you feel good about where you are going? I would uh, divide the company into two parts, and this is in part a reference to an earlier question of whether I would uh, invest in in, in Freddie Mac. And, one, and that's a relevant issue because I have been an investment person for most of my, my life. And if I could divide Freddie Mac into two parts, I would definitely invest in the company from 2009 on. I am incredibly proud of the work of our employees from 2009 on. We have a very, very high quality book. Our people are entirely committed to making sure we participate in responsible lending going forward. Okay. I mean, as CEOs, that is the answer I would hope to hear, that you are both you know, proud of your con uh, companies and, and you have high expectations for them. Uh, since entering uh, conservatorship, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or the enterprises uh, have taken $169 billion from the Treasury and still owe taxpayers $141 billion. So government ownership of Fannie and Freddie is now the most expensive bailout of the 2008 financial crisis, which sets you on a different level than private sector companies who, you know, if they are profitable, uh, that is good. Uh, if they give big bonuses, that is fine. The taxpayers aren't paying for those, so you know, they are not as concerned. But right now the taxpayers are paying for these, and they are very concerned, and that is why we are having this hearing. Uh, Mr. DeMarco, getting back to the beginning of the hearing when, when Mr. Issa, Chairman Issa was talking about uh, salaries, According to reports, Mr. Williams and Mr. Haldeman uh, made about $4.7 million and $5.1 million, respectively, last year. And I think uh, um, Mr. Williams' uh, base salary was $900,000, and uh, uh, Mr. Haldeman uh, was similar to that. So obviously, big bonuses involved to reach that $4.7 and $5.1 million. Uh, you know, and as was mentioned several times, say President Obama makes 400,000 during the span. We, as members of Congress, make 174,000, and I think you made uh, about 240,000. Do you think that the work of Mr. Williams and Mr. Haldeman warrants eight times as much pay as the President of the United States? Um, as an economist, sir, I believe that the. Uh, uh, what is perceived as uh, the total compensation value and benefit of various positions goes beyond just the salary that is there. So I don't find it fruitful to measure the compensation of the President of the United States with those of uh, um, CEOs of major corporations. Well, how about members of Congress right now? The disapproval rating for Congress is pretty high, and, and even though I think all of our colleagues here feel that we work very hard, uh, I, I think people feel we get paid too much and, and our Deficit is $14.3 trillion and rising. Uh, I think that if Congress felt that they should get a bonus because we are doing a good job right now, we would all be voted out of office and should be, because be clearly you know, the deficit continues. And, and uh, you all owe the taxpayers $141 billion. So when taxpayers are seeing millions of dollars in bonuses going uh, to the executives, I, I understand their outrage. And, Mr. Haldeman, you, you said you understood that, too. So, uh, Mr. DeMarco, as the conservator of Fannie and Freddie, uh, you are nominally the boss of Mr. Williams and Mr. Haldeman. Um, you know, they can't do much without talking to you first. So do you think that their work is ten times harder or ten times more complex than yours, and uh, maybe that uh, the members of Congress? Uh, so is, it, is their salary difference justified? 
I don't think anyone is going to agree, including me, that anyone is working 10 times harder than I am right now, Congressman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, are they justified then? I mean, should should they be getting two and three? I believe that given bonuses? the framework that was put in place, they are justified because the framework was designed in consultation with the special master of Treasury, looking at large financial institutions okay. that operate as private companies, not as government agencies, to develop a compensation structure and amounts. I believe that what we struck here was an appropriate balance cognizant of what the marketplace looks like. Well, again, you know, bonuses should be based on performance. And uh, you know, clearly, I think it is dubious that the performance is there to warrant million dollars of bonuses with that type of debt to the American taxpayers. I understand why they are upset. I am upset. And, but I do thank you all for appearing here. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Maloney from New York is recognized for five minutes. Uh, th thank you. And I would like to continue on this line uh, and ask about the bizarre situation uh, with bonuses. Um, when things are going well for a company, bonuses are awarded for positive performance. But when things are going poorly, uh, we hear the argument today that bonuses are necessary for recruitment and retention. In other words, it always seems like a good time to, for an executive bonus. And uh, when you announced, uh, Mr. DeMarco, uh, these new compensation packages in 2009, you issued a press release defending the high salaries, even though Fannie and Freddie were going into conservatorship uh, after major losses. And uh, they have continued to lose money. Uh, they have been bailed out to the tune of $169 billion in taxpayers' money. And I am told that uh, Fannie has asked for an additional $7.8 billion and Freddie for an additional uh, $6 billion. And the compensation plan that I uh, looked at, I agree with my friend on the other side of the aisle, but the compensation plan uh, here uh, that I have looked at in both Fannie and Freddie, and I like to put it in the record, uh, it consists of approximately $6 million for each executive. And I would like to place that in, in the record. And your basic argument that you have given to both sides of the aisle today is that it is necessary to attract and retain talent. So my question is, is, is there ever a wrong time to award lucrative bonuses, Mr. DeMarco? Uh, there are, Congresswoman, and we have. When these companies were placed into conservatorship, all bonuses were eliminated at the company. We had a number of senior executives leave the company. There were no severance or golden parachute payments made to them. The folks that were most responsible for the companies ending up in conservatorship uh, left without anything taken. In fact, the, the collapse of their stock price uh, did much to reduce the value of compensation they had earned prior. The difficulty that we have at FHFA as conservator Fannie and Freddie is that the country still needs to have a functioning secondary mortgage market. I have got two GSEs here that needed government assistance in order to continue to function in the marketplace. We replaced the leadership of those companies that led to the conservatorship. But now I have got to be able to attract people in to run multi-trillion dollar companies knowing that there is going to be this flow of losses from business decisions they had nothing to but, do with. But, but let, me, let me say that a lot of your comments today sound very much like uh, AIGs. And I would like to pace, place AIGs statement on, in the defense of their bonuses in the record. And uh, in, in their statement, they said that, that they had asked their employees uh, who received retention payments or bonuses or stocks or any, any type of pay in any form of $100,000 or more to return at least half of those payments. And I would like to put AIG's statement in the record, too. And my question, Mr. DeMarco, would you at least uh, do as much as AIG did? Will you ask executives at Fannie and Freddie to return half of their retention payments, their retention bonuses, their retention payments? I will not, Congresswoman. I believe that would be a breach of faith with the agreement that I have struck with the employees of this company, of these two companies. And I believe that trying to take such action at this point would be detrimental to the taxpayers' interest in it. I know how difficult this is and, and how frustrating it is. I, 
but I believe that to take such actions would not help the American taxpayer at this point, and it would not help Earlier, the country's you housing you spoke uh, rather movingly about public service, about people who take a job to give back to the community, to help their country. And, and Fannie and Freddie are no longer answering to shareholders. They are answering to taxpayers. They are not only answering to taxpayers for their salary and the bonuses, which I believe they don't deserve, but they are answering to the taxpayer for the continued bailout that continues for these two entities. So you are in a very different structure now. And, uh, and, and I would say you should look for employees who want to give back to their country with their talent. And in fact, yesterday, uh, as the chairman knows, we had a bill passed out of financial services that will treat AIG like every other government agency and be on the pay scale of every other government agency and will not include bonuses. So Congress is acting to move in a way that is more appropriate for an agency that continues to be bailed out, is no longer answering to shareholders, but answering to the American taxpayer. And the American taxpayer, uh, 14 million of them, are without jobs and struggling. It is hard for them to understand how executives get $6 million in pay for a failing entity. Uh, surely there are talented people. Uh, that can handle these jobs and do it in a way, in a pay scale appropriate uh, with government agencies. Uh, I yield back. My time has expired. Yeah. I have a lot more to say, but my time has expired. <laughs> I, I thank my colleague. Um, uh, Mr. DeMarco, I just want to take a moment. We are approaching the noon hour. Uh, we have a few more uh, witness, uh, members that want to ask questions, but I just want to take a moment of personal uh, privilege and, and uh, say thank you for serving as a human shield. Uh, this morning. I know it has been tough, but we, we certainly thank you for your service. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, with that, Mr. Gowdy, uh, the subcommittee chairman, uh, Mr. Gowdy is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Haldeman, why did the enterprise enter a conservatorship? The enterprise entered a conservatorship in uh, September 2008 uh, because of the se severe economic stress our company was under and, in the words of Secretary Paulson, felt a timeout was necessary. Well, do you agree with Mr. DeMarco? Because in his testimony, he said it was a series of poor business decisions that led to the conservatorship. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Um, in, in my tenure at, at Freddie Mac, I have tried very hard to I am I'm, I'm not asking about that. I am asking about decisions that led up to the entering of a conservatorship? It is a very simple question. Were there poor business decisions that led to that? The answer is obviously yes. I mean, we can have this exercise as long as you want to have it, but the answer has to be yes, right? Or else there wouldn't have been a conservatorship. It is uh, difficult for me to say that because I don't want to second guess my predecessors. Well, we are paying you a handsome salary because you are supposed to be an expert in the field. And you are not going to second guess your predecessors? It is because it is um, very difficult to say what, you would have done, what one would have done at that point in time, given those, those circumstances and pressures that they were under. So you can't think of a single poor business decision that was made prior to 2008? Um, I can uh, talk about some decisions that were made that uh, I hope I would do differently, but I would prefer uh, not to characterize them as poor business decisions. Well, Mr. DeMarco, it is it, your language, poor business decisions. What specifically did you mean by poor business decisions uh, by his predecessors? He is obviously reluctant to go into that. Hopefully, you will not be as reluctant. Mr. Gowdy, both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac reduced their underwriting standards, allowed much greater risk in terms of the mortgages that they uh, purchased. They reduced the uh, guarantee fees, the, the insurance that they were charging for this, and they made investments in private label mortgage-backed securities that, while at the time were all rated by private credit rating agencies as AAA rated securities, clearly we have seen that there was substantial risk in those, in those uh, instruments. And so these are business decisions made by the executives of, of those 
companies at the time to make, time to make period? these decisions. This is largely occurring in the period from 2005 to the first half of 2008. Who was Daniel Mudd? He was the CEO of Fannie Mae during this period. What was his total compensation? I don't know off the top of my head, sir. So you wouldn't disagree if it were $12 million? That could be right. How about Richard Siren? Who he was, was the CEO of Freddie Mac. Uh, during what time period? Um, I'm not sure, but it ended at the time of conservatorship. Exactly. 2003 to 2008. Now, what was his total compensation for that time period? Again, I'm sorry, sir. I don't know that. Would you disagree with me if I told you it was more than $38 million? I could believe that. All right. So surely you can understand the frustration of taxpayers who are paying bonuses while the bus is driving through the gates of hell, right. and then you want us to pay bonuses while the people change the tires. Yeah. I can certainly understand the frustration. And, you know, this committee doesn't know me very well, but I've been a career civil servant my entire life, and most of that career service has been in policy positions in which I have tried to advise policymakers, including numerous Congresses, of the risks to the taxpayer in the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac model. It gives me no satisfaction or pleasure to be sitting here as conservator of these companies at this point, seeing the devastation of the American taxpayer that's resulted when I spent the better part of my career trying to warn policymakers of the risks that were inherent in the structure that was in place pre-conservatorship, and it's why I would like to end this hearing with the same plea that I began at the beginning. I would like for FHFA and is ready to work with the Congress and the administration to bring these conservatorships to an end and to build a more robust, sound housing finance system well, for the future. Well, I want to ask you about that. Who was James Johnson? James Johnson was the CEO of Fannie Mae prior to Dan, uh, back in the 1990s. And what was his total compensation during that time period? It was substantial, sir. I don't know. $100 million. Right. Now, he had a good working relationship with Congress, right? Yes, he did. Okay. Now, Franklin Raines, what was his total compensation? I don't know, sir. Would you disagree if it were more than $90 million? I then he I had a good working that. relationship with Congress. So right. sitting here simply saying that we need a better working relationship with Congress, one could argue that's what got us into this abyss. I'm sorry, I, I don't recall saying having a better working relationship with Congress. I thought I said I've heard you mention the word Congress a half dozen times. And, Mr. Chairman, if I could have 30 more seconds, the graveyard is full of people who are waiting on federal judgeships that never came. And I've heard the argument time and time again that we have to raise compensation levels for Federal judges so we can attract the right kind of people. And yet every time there is an opening, there are 100 folks that are dying for it. They will take a tremendous cut in pay. Now, I find it bitterly ironic that the total compensation for the United States Supreme Court justices is less than either of these two men made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Connolly, uh, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Um, I know you uh, would like to do nothing better than be here today uh, before this committee. Um, Mr. DeMarco, if I understood your testimony, you make the argument that putting aside histrionics, putting aside public opinion, even putting aside the opinion here in the Congress, uh, the problem, the challenge you face is that uh, a substantial number of the mortgages of the United States are tied up in these two organizations, and you have got to find competent, highly qualified, skilled managers willing to, uh, uh, to manage at Freddie Mac and, and, and Fannie Mae, and therefore you have to uh, give a nod towards sort of uh, what the marketplace offers in terms of skilled managerial leadership and thus the compensation we are looking at. That is correct, Congressman. Would you agree, though, that given the fact that these are GSEs, uh, given the fact that the taxpayer has invested very heavily now directly in trying to uh, straighten the ship of state for both Freddie and Fannie, that transparency rules might be a little different for these two organizations than for a private commercial entity on Wall Street? Um, I think that there can be uh, allowance for greater transparency, yes, sir. Well, allowance for, uh, as a public servant, as a fellow public servant, what, in your view, where is that line? 
I mean, so presumably several, several that line is different than a private entity, a purely private entity in Wall Street. So what do we as policymakers here in the Hill and, and what, more importantly, does the public have a right to expect by way of transparency in compensation packages and policies? Well, with res I, I believe that these companies are continuing to operate as private companies, as SEC registrants, and the public is certainly entitled to know, uh, to have the same disclosures of uh, compensation of the executives as is of other firms, and that is done. And furthermore, we have detailed, the FHFA has detailed the executive compensation program and structure that is in place for these companies. But we go beyond that with respect to disclosure, and we provide numerous reports to the Congress on the conservatorship operations, both in terms of detailing the sources of the losses that have led to these taxpayer draws and detailing the, uh, the activities that are underway at both companies to uh, assist homeowners. Mr. DeMarco, uh uh, you are familiar with the Inspector General report that was actually critical with the compensation system, and I quote, FHFA has neither developed written procedures to evaluate the enterprise's recommended compensation level, the enterprise is referring to Fannie and Freddie, right. each year, nor required agency staff to verify and test the means by which the enterprise calculate their recommended compensation levels. Do you disagree with that? I am familiar with the finding, and I can explain it, but yes, sir, I am familiar with it. We have agreed to uh, take the recommended remediation that the IG had in its report. So you are going to have written procedures? We will have written procedures. When might we see such written procedures? I have assured the Inspector General we will have those in place by the end of this year in time for the review of the coming year's um, given performance. The, given the uh, ostensible inadequacies identified by the IG, um, uh, why wouldn't we have a little bit less confidence that the compensation programs, bonuses and other compensation, given the lack of transparency, lack of clear criteria and policies, lack of written policies, why should we have faith that that is just the ticket, that is what we need to make sure we are getting the right people to manage Fannie and Freddie? So it is a fair question, Congressman, but the, the companies themselves that disclose the, uh, the scorecards and the ratings on them. What the IG was referring to was within FHFA, the FHFA internal review process, these scorecards did not have written procedures as to how that should be done. The IG did not say we didn't have a process. He said we did not have one documented. And he's quite right about that, and I believe that that is a, a proper control system, and we have agreed to put that in place. With regard to the calculations themselves, this is the IG saying, well, you have delegated to the companies to undertake normal day-to-day -day operations, including calculating pay, but we think with regard to these executives, you ought to send an FHFA examiner in there to recheck the calculations that have been done uh, to, determine the, to determine the pay. Um, we have agreed to do that. One final question, if the Chairman will allow. Um, uh, this uh, committee, uh, Mr. Cummings, specifically uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the minority at least, requested uh, copies of compensation agreements from your office. We received recently heavily redacted copies of documents. Is it your position that this committee is not entitled to see the actual unredacted compensation agreements involved with Fannie and Freddie? Uh, sir, um, I this has to do with uh, distinguishing people who are named executive officers and those that are not, and it is trying to respect the privacy rights of those people. But we have provided the committee, I believe, with a great deal of information detailing uh, the individual executives at the company and the, and the compensation that is being paid. W would the gentleman yield? Oh, of course, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DeMarco, the majority feels that you have been generally forthcoming, but we would ask would you be willing to provide all compensation packages that include bonuses with the names redacted, however, with, if you will, numbers that could be referenced when we are going through the skill set, so that the gentleman, although he's, you are very right, we don't need to know the names of every individual, we want that respected, we would appreciate it if, if we could go to compensation levels far below a normal 10K level, and I think that is what the gentleman would like to see. Quite correct. Yeah. We, we will provide that. Thank you. I thank the Chair. You are very welcome. We now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle, for thank five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to uh, our panelists, uh, in particular Mr. DeMarco, for being here and for lasting this long. Um, I just have a few questions, mostly follow up to some of the uh, testimony that I have heard this morning. Um, you mentioned in your testimony, Mr. DeMarco, and, and my colleague who has since left from New York <clears throat> talked about the need to retain the need to attract quality employees. And so that was a justification for these, these incredible salaries and bonuses. But then you talked about, in many instances, salaries, um, what we pay people, are it is almost irrelevant. Maybe they have a passion for it. Maybe they have an interest in it. Maybe they are just interested in doing the greater good. So which is it? I mean, wh which one do you think should be the motivation here for these salaries? I believe those motivations are, are, are personal, and I think that uh, what I am looking at in terms of running overseeing two companies with 12,000 people is I have got to be concerned about that there, most of those people are concerned about what their compensation is. The one other difference here that I think makes this sort of not such a, a, a clean this or that is that to work at Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac today leaves the employees, whether they are an executive or they are a secretary, with the fundamental risk of, I don't know how long this company is going to be around, and I don't know what I am you know, working for long term. And I think that that is also um, a very tricky thing for us as conservators, tricky for the two CEOs in trying to encourage people to, to stay engaged at their, at their companies. Well, and I would agree with that, except for Fannie and Freddie have the ability, and, and now in the, we're talking about third quarter losses, and they've now gone back to the Treasury and made huge requests right. for additional money. So, so that, right. but anyway, I, I guess my thought is maybe we need to reconsider if it's performance. These third quarter losses should be of concern to everyone, and in particular the American taxpayer. Right. Uh, Congresswoman, know. I certainly agree with that. And I, if, if I may, I mean, I would. I would say that, uh, and this is in my written statement, that we are, you know, for next year, certainly looking again at the at the corporate scorecards, and we're looking at, you know, w the condition of the company as well as, you know, the gradual shrinkage uh, taking place at the company. And, and I've made clear we're trying to reduce compensation every time a position comes open. We're making serious effort to be filling it at a lower compensation. Okay. Um, speaking of the corporate scorecards, I mean, you mentioned earlier. Um, you assess performance. What do you base that corporate scorecard on? Is that based on the, the uh, HAMP program? That is only one component, and, and HAMP is reflective of doing loan modifications generally, which is a critical loss mitigation activity taking place at Feeney and Freddie for the benefit of not just helping homeowners that are troubled in their mortgages, but also to reduce losses to the taxpayer on troubled mortgages. So I believe that is an important element for us to be assessing. I'm sure, though, you're aware of the issues with HAMP, the HAMP program, that it's a failed program, and maybe that isn't what we should be basing the standard on. Well, if I, if, the, I, if, I, if I may, because that's, I, I, General has, has brought out about that HAMP program. Yes, Congresswoman, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that there's a lot of concern and criticism of the HAMP program, and certainly the number of HAMP modifications is not what the administration projected it initially would be. But I would point out that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not just undertaking HAMP modifications, but in fact they're going much further, and we have been uh, collectively working on an array of, lo of loan modification opportunities for homeowners that go well beyond. Beyond HAMP, which is why it's been reported HAMP's done whatever it is, 800,000 loan modifications. Fannie and Freddie alone have done just under 1 million permanent loan modifications, and the performance of those modifications has been quite good, and it has led to a reduction in taxpayer losses. So we're trying to go beyond HAMP, go beyond the limits of HAMP to offer homeowners a good opportunity, respective of the taxpayer. And, and I would respectfully request that you provide, there must be a standard, a compilations of all of these standards that you are using. And if you could submit that to the committee, I would appreciate that. Certainly, Congressman. We would be now, glad to do that. In my few seconds that are left, um, many would argue that the housing market was the primary reason that there was such a financial crisis in 2008. And so in response to that, the knee-jerk reaction was to pass Dodd-Frank, which we are hearing from our financial institutions, the community banks, the banks in general, what a difficult and onerous and regulatory, unreasonable bill this is. And yet, Fannie and Freddie are not included or covered by Dodd-Frank. Probably one of the biggest reasons that this whole crisis occurred was the housing market. Can, can anyone on the panel explain that to me? Why was Fannie and Freddie left out of the Dodd-Frank bill? 
I can't explain it, but I certainly can say that it was a point of some argument during the uh, development and debate regarding Dodd-Frank. Um, I believe the administration and the, and the leadership that was uh, uh, pushing the Dodd-Frank legislation through felt like that uh, the housing market was too unstable and that they wanted a different vehicle to focus on, on housing finance. I say that not to be for it or again it just to say that, uh, that there were certainly plenty in Congress that wanted to see Fannie and Freddie be part of the legislation. That is not how the legislative process worked out. Thank you very much, Mr. DeMarco. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. We now recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I certainly appreciate this hearing. Uh, Mr. DeMarco, uh, my own profession, that is to say the profession before I came to the Congress already had a bad name. I was a lawyer. Uh, and I must say, I think that uh, Fannie and Freddie have given home ownership a bad name. Uh, that is why I am interested in your oversight of your own lawyers. Uh, I want to continue to, I was particularly struck by this, the uh, uh, law firm, apparently a major law firm, the Baum Law Firm, you uh, used, uh, which um, a New York uh, District Court judge and this is really unusual for a judge to, it may even be a, 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 a call to, for, for someone to go before the, the, uh, the Ethics Committee of the Bar. Uh, it talked about finding falsities contained in five paragraphs out of only ten in an entire petition that the uh, Brown firm had, um, had uh, uh, submitted. Uh, this was a foreclosure case. The case was uh, Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation versus Rhea. And the judge went on to say that the misrepresentations, here I am quoting the judge, of the material statements uh, was outrageous and the firm has impeded the proper administration of justice. Uh, what struck me is that the judge said that this was not the first time that the Baum firm had been unethical. How could how could uh, a law firm uh, operate on behalf of Fannie and Freddie after being sanctioned like that if this was not the first time? Uh, Congressman, I'm not, uh, forgive me, I'm not familiar with the particular case that you are citing. I can report to you that both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have uh, ceased doing uh, new business with this uh, particular law firm when, when issues regarding it uh, certainly came to our collective attention. Uh, each company well, what, uh, uh, Why was this, this law firm kept on uh, after being sanctioned? Is this, is this firm, was this firm considered such the outstanding firm uh, for, for Fred, Fannie and Freddie that you had to have its services? Well, I, I, I can't speak to the timing here, uh, Ms. Norton. I, I do know that uh, when this uh, information regarding the firm uh, came to uh, came to our attention, are you are you following the firm's uh, uh, um, are you are you following the conduct of the firms that you have? Well, we've gone further than that, uh, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, FHFA just very recently directed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to begin uh, the. Uh, uh, wind down of their um, uh, retained attorney networks. There are their lists of uh, law firms around the country that are used to process foreclosures. So this whole approach to doing business this way and the direct engagement between Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and individual law firms is, um, is uh, on a path to cease. We are stopping this entirely. Well, that is good news. Uh, we understand that you have said that the firms would now have to meet, quote, and here I am quoting, certain minimum uniform criteria. What are those criteria? Those are in the process of being developed. Well, could I ask that you submit to the Chairman and the Ranking Member uh, a draft of those uh, criteria when, when they are completed? When will they be completed? Um, I, I know that the work is actively going on. I can't tell you exactly, but um, I think over the next uh, next couple of months we're looking to have this wrapped up. We're working not just with Fannie and Freddie on this, but we're working with the with the primary federal banking agencies, because the um, the banking agencies, as you know, have been involved in in over oversight 
of what the banks as mortgage servicers have been doing in this area, and uh, the law firm actually works for the mortgage servicer. So we are trying to get alignment between the standards that we believe are appropriate here, get the bank regulators aligned with us on that, so that there is uniformity in the mortgage market with regard to the performance expectations and standards for which we are going to hold law firms accountable. Um, and so this work is actively underway, and what we are hoping for here is rather than a disparate set of standards, that we can come to one set of standards in which there is going to be better accountability for law firms that are doing foreclosure processing. About the last thing that Freddie and Fannie need, uh, our law firms drive them, drive them into further trouble than the American people already find. Uh, uh, hold them accountable for. Thank you very well, much. Would the gentlelady yield? I uh, would be glad to yield. I just want to understand, general counsels that you pay effectively over $1,000 an hour, $2.6 and $2.9 million, respectively, they are working to try to figure out how to manage law firms, outside law firms, but that is why we had to pay, instead of three or 400000 for a general counsel, we had to pay nearly $3 million, right, so that they would not know better than this, but after the fact, they would begin working on standards to, to do better. They had standards. They had standards written into the contract. They were not identical. And certainly with the foreclosure abuses that have been identified and the problems that just a, as few firms have done to tarnish an entire industry, we believe that we are taking appropriate action to try to remediate that and that as a matter of simplifying Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and as part of the sort of gradual stepping back of the size and complexity of those companies, it was my judgment that the appropriate step to take was to not have Fannie and Freddie continue to maintain this separate relationship with individual law firms, but that that was better done and would get better execution on mortgage servicing if it was done all through the existing mortgage servicer. Well, I thank the gentlelady for yield, and I certainly share with you the concern that uh, maybe they have reached a better conclusion, but I, I sort of, it is interesting that it was government officials who interceded, people who make less than a quarter of a million dollars a year because of the failure of, of multiple, nearly $3 million a year uh, general counsels in this so-called private sector. I thank the lady for bringing this and up. Mr. Chairman, uh, and, and, and the draft that the gentleman has said would, would be submitted to you and the ranking member seems to me is important. We look forward to seeing it expeditiously. We now recognize the chairman of the subcommittee, Patrick McHenry, the gentleman from Hickory, North Carolina. I thank the chairman. Um, Mr. Marco, has FHFA ever rejected a compensation package presented to you? Yes, we yes we've had we've had uh, uh, proposals made that we've said no that's not acceptable let's go back and redo it. Would you be would you be willing to submit that for the for the record once you can gather the documents? Um, well, I will try to find something appropriate to submit for the for the record here, Congressman. These are done as uh, as as proposals that are made from the board, and I I, I look at them and I make uh, determinations right. based upon the comparables and the I other understand. standards in place. I understand. I understand. <clears throat> um, and so so I'd ask you, uh, Mr. Demarco, has has the White House ever uh, been in contact with you about uh, compensation issues? Uh, we, under the pre Senior Preferred Stock Purchase Agreement that provides the Treasury support to Fannie and Freddie, part of that agreement is written into it that the FHFA shall consult with the Treasury Department on executive compensation. So this is done as a consultation. Um, with every executive uh, uh, compensation package that I have to approve, it is sent to the Treasury Department for their review. We request a consultation with the Treasury on this. This area was obviously most active in 2009 when we were working with Ken Feinberg, who was the special master Sir, for executive compensation. Has the White House ever reached out to you? Is I, have not, I, I have not had any conversation with the White House regarding executive compensation. Okay. Um, Mr. Haldeman, has the White House uh, contacted you regarding uh, executive compensation at your firm? They have not contacted me okay. in any way. Thank you. Has the Treasury? Um, no. Okay. Mr. Williams, has the White House ever contacted you regarding executive compensation at your firm? No, they have not, Congressman. Has the Treasury? No, they have not. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> 
Okay. This is interesting because there has been a hue and cry from, from the President in particular about executive compensation, and it, and it is uh, somewhat strange to me that uh, in an area where he could exert influence, he has chosen not to. Um, we, additionally, um, <clears throat> you know, Mr. Williams, Mr. Haldeman, it has been mentioned in the press that part of your um, bonus compensation is tied to uh, your uh, uh, relationship with the HAMP program, the Home Affordable Mortgage uh, Program <clears throat> that the administration has put on, mortgage modifications. But it has been reported in Politico that uh, uh, 35 percent of your compensation is tied to uh, what you connect and actually get modified through the HAMP program. Is that correct? Congressman, uh, we look at an array of goals under our total loss mitigation efforts. So we not only look at HAMP modifications, but also our own modifications, as well as short sales, deeds in lieu, and activities around our REO, including uh, activities we have done to, to open up mortgage help centers in many districts and provide counseling to, to uh, neighbors. So HAMP is one of many metrics that fit into the overall but that is not, is that an individual metric or is mortgage modifications one of your metrics and HAMP is within that? HAMP is one of modification within a series, is one goal within a series of metrics that we are looking at. And what percentage of your, comp and, uh, your bonus structure is uh, tied to that? Congressman, uh, the Board looks at the totality of our. I understand the Board actually laid out these metrics right. for how you would be compensated beyond your normal day-to-day -day compensation, if you hit these metrics, they would reward you financially. I understand the Board created this. Right. But you are aware of what that contractual, what, what those goals are, are you not? Correct. Okay. So what percentage of your uh, bonus compensation deals with mortgage modifications? Congressman, that is what I was trying to say. The Board evaluates my performance based on the totality of the scorecard. Our efforts in credit loss mitigation are an important component of that. They look at the totality of the scorecard. Mr. Chairman, I ask uh, unanimous consent for an additional minute. Because Without objection. Minute. Thank you. You are not answering my question, Mr. Williams. What percentage of your compensation is tied to mortgage modifications? Congressman, I am answering your question. It, our compensation, my compensation, is tied to our performance against all the goals and objectives, and we are evaluated based, and I am evaluated based on how the company does against each of those metrics. The board doesn't assign a specific weighting to each individual metric. So it's more of a feeling, right? I mean, if you're laying out this metric, I mean, in your 2009-10K, goal number one. Is, uh, is your performance to help in the housing recovery, including mortgage modifications. Goal number two, interestingly enough, is to protect taxpayers. This is your 10K. Mm -hmm. Goal number three is, uh, is, uh, was to measure, manage, and reduce enterprise risk more effectively. Interesting order of how this is, is to be done, I mean, with the intent that you repay the taxpayers. So you don't have any, there is no weighting to, to this? So if you had zero mortgage modifications, but you were able to save the taxpayers a few more dollars, you could get the same bonus that you currently get? If I had not performed on all the goals, then I would be held accountable for that, Congressman. Uh, the, the Chair would like to inform the gentleman we are going to have a second round. Fantastic. I, th this is uh, this is very important. And I ask unanimous consent to submit, uh, for the record, the August 31st uh, uh, Politico article, Fannie, Freddie, Dole out big bonuses. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. We now will start our second round. The gentleman, oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Jackie, I'm getting new glasses, I promise. Uh, before I recognize the gentlelady from California, it is the intent of the Chair to finish including a second round by 1 o'clock sharp. 
So if members start showing up here, I will assure you I will attempt to reach them all, but I will not keep you past 1 o'clock. You have been very, very patient. We now recognize the gentlelady, my friend from California, way far down there. Way Mrs. down. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, witnesses, for appearing here today. <clears throat> we have been talking about accountability. And it is my understanding that Mr. DeMarco makes determinations on the salaries of the CEO of Fannie and Freddie based on performance. Would you agree with that, Mr. DeMarco? Yes. All right. Let me ask you, um, Mr. Williams, at a Senate hearing yesterday, it was disclosed that Fannie failed to contact nearly 60 percent of all borrowers for loan modifications. How would you score, how would you grade your performance on that? Congresswoman, I am not specifically familiar with the fact, but what I will tell you is that we manage our servicers, and our servicers are held responsible for reaching out to the borrowers. We have taken an, undertaken a number of efforts to ensure that our servicers are held accountable. We have increased our incentives. All right, Mr. Williams, 60 percent is not accountable. So what I am asking you to do, um, and through the Chair, is go back and determine whether or not it is accurate to say that 60 percent of your borrowers have not been contacted for loan modifications. Mr. Halderman, it was disclosed yesterday at the Senate hearing that 80 percent of your borrowers, not 60 percent, but 80 percent of your borrowers were not contacted for loan modifications. Are you familiar with that? What period of time was that statistic? I, I, don't think it, I don't think it matters. I think the fact that 80 percent of the borrowers have not been notified is a, an F. For, for any period of time. My, the reason for me inquiring about time period was to, to see how far in the past that was and whether we are making progress in terms of more right party contact o over time. I, believe I think it has been within this year. Within the, I, I would, Congressman, I am sorry. I am not personally familiar with what was reported in the Senate yesterday, but I would find these numbers a bit hard to believe. Okay. Would you, upon reviewing that, provide this information to the committee so that we can assess your performance based on that kind of information? A um, absolutely. Now, to you, Mr. Sure. DeMarco, you have um, been at a number of meetings that have been scheduled with the gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. Cummings, and I thought we made great progress at the last meeting. Uh, we already know that the HARP program has only reached about 800,000 homeowners, that there are some 11 million homeowners who are underwater with their loans. And you had provided us with information that would suggest, if I remember correctly, about 3 million of those homeowners fall under Fannie or Freddie. And based on the proposal that the President suggested, where if these are homeowners who have been paying their mortgages on time, with the exception of maybe one in the last year, um, that they could, in fact, refinance their loans uh, from whatever the percentage is now, which is probably close to 6 percent to maybe as, as low as 4 percent. And that looked all very good, but we haven't heard a peep from you since. So I would like to know what is happening with that program. Certainly. I am pleased to answer that, Congresswoman. First of all, um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac don't have 3 million underwater mortgages. That is referencing something closer to the HARP eligible universe. But you are quite right. We have had some very healthy discussions regarding the HARP program and its opportunity to assist borrowers that have a mortgage owned or guaranteed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac to be able to refinance. When I made the announcement regarding the changes to the HARP program, we said that we would have the directives out to um, the seller servicers, that is, the people that actually service mortgages and originate them for Fannie and Freddie. We would have the detailed guidance regarding HARP out to them by November 15th. That was yesterday. That went out yesterday afternoon. So now the mortgage community, the lenders out there, now have the updated guidance with regard to how the HARP program is working. Um, and what the changes are, what that means operationally for them. And so as of today, they have got that information and they should be gearing up to be implementing the changes to the HARP program. So I can say to my constituents, you can go to any bank, any of the big five right now, that are all of whom are in the HARP program, 
and ask them to refinance your loan. And if one won't do it, another one will, because the servicers are just going to make money off of this, correct? Well, we, we were trying to encourage servicers to reach out to borrowers to let them know that this uh, opportunity is available to them. Different institutions are going to need different amounts of time to actually make the operational changes to implement the, the new program, but they have known it was coming, and the big ones have certainly been all geared up for it and are looking forward to participating. So they might all be ready at slightly different time periods, but I would expect in the very near future all of them are up and running with it. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. I will now recognize myself for a second round. Uh, earlier, I, uh, I brought up the subject of general counsels. Uh, Mr. DeMarco, uh, it, well, actually, I will do it this way. Mr. Williams, what were your legal fees in 2010, outside legal fees? Congressman, I will have to check on that and get back to you. Mr. Haldeman, what were your outside legal fees approximately? I will have to get back to you with a good number on that. Mr. DeMarco, do you know how much they are spending in outside counsel of all sort? Uh, not off the top of my head, sir. But is it fair to say that all of these lawsuits that you were earlier justified, uh, a $2.9 million compensation package for uh, Mr. Uh, Bostrom, uh, was because you needed somebody that could manage these various lawsuits? So the question is, are these lawsuits being done by his, his observation, or are they basically being done by outside counsel? And do you need to spend $2.9 million on an, or roughly $1,000 an hour if he works 3,000 billable hours a year? Do you need to spend that much to get somebody to hire outside counsel? It is a team effort in, in pursuing this litigation. Well, then how Mr. much is the Chairman, entire team and Mr. Ba Mr. Bostrom is no longer now, employed by Freddie Mac. Okay. Well, then, Mr. Um, Popolis? Uh, the general counsel over at uh, Fannie Mae at $2.6 million. It, it isn't a whole lot different. The qu you know, when I hear team effort, I say, great. I know, I, look, I go to baseball and football games. I am not asking what the whole roster got paid. I am asking about the, you know, the, uh, the, I don't know whether he is the quarterback or the coach, but the question is, if I go to major Fortune 500 corporations that have huge uh, patent portfolios and they are suing constantly, and they pay a quarter as much this or a half this amount, including stock bonuses, very seldom are they going to get to 2.6. But more importantly, I see some sort of a direct relation. What I heard earlier is, geez, they got, you guys got, kind of got swamped in how to administer the job because this was so unique. $2.9 million is a pretty good chunk of money. Isn't it enough to get some of the finest former U.S. attorneys who make $160,000 a year, who know about uh, uh, suits and litigation. We have a former U.S. attorney who is a member of this committee, and when, I believe when he went from being a U.S. attorney to being uh, a congressman, he actually got a small pay raise, getting to $174,000. Uh, your salary seems to be sufficient to keep you overseeing people who make more than 10 times what you make. We are putting that to the test on a daily basis. Touche. I would like to move to another one. And uh, although executive compensation and performance is a subject here, this is tangentially required and, or, or uh, uh, involved. Yesterday, when I read, Uncle Sam is a reluctant landlord of foreclosed homes. A quarter of a million, 248,000, they reported homes are currently for sale or rent. They have a number further down in the article that is closer to a million. Mr. Williams, have you done everything you can do to quickly sell and get back in the hands of people who will maintain homes or to rent to people who can afford to pay the rent on the homes, even if they are the existing, current uh, uh, debtor? Congressman, we have an expand, expansive REO operation that we run. We are constantly looking to move properties. We first we rehabilitate the property. We look to preserve the community through the execution. We also work with community groups. And we, more importantly, we focus on people who want to come in and own the home, because that is the best thing that you can do for the neighborhood. But isn't we, it true that by the time you actually do a liquidation sale of a home, it has typically been in foreclosure and often unoccupied or even occupied by not the original owners, but by somebody they sublet to or somebody that simply squatted for a year or more, and the home is, a, is devalued considerably because of that intervening period. 
Congressman, we try to take over the properties as quickly as possible when they go through foreclosure. Much of what we are all dealing with today is the fact that properties are staying in foreclosure for extended periods of time, which ends up adversely affecting the properties. Have you come to Congress for relief so that you can foreclose more expeditiously or, in fact, even convert a, a homeowner who clearly cannot and is not making payments into a tenant? Congressman, we actually do have a tenant in place program of which we are renting back properties to about 10,000 borrowers. 10,000 out of millions? Out of millions. So the question I asked you, and, and maybe I will go to Mr. Haldeman because you guys are slightly different in your organizations. Do you need, can Congress give you greater authority so that, in fact, these sort of expeditious conversions will cause less loss of asset to the community? Because, you know, Mr. Cummings and I come from very different communities. Mine is more suburban, his is more urban. The one thing we know, though, is no matter where a foreclosed property is, the entire neighborhood suffers during that entire period. It is not just the asset that the taxpayer is losing on. Do you have all the tools? And 10,000 rentals uh, into a million homes doesn't sound like the tool is working very well. Mr. Haldeman, do you have all the tools you need so these homes are occupied, maintained, and as productive as possible, regardless of whether or not the current uh, uh, debtor is able to make payments? Mr. Chairman, we uh, have worked with uh, Fannie and with FHFA on a servicer alignment initiative, which I think is going to allow us to more effectively deal with the problem that you are talking about. That is, have increased pressure on our servicers to, to do some of the things you are speaking of. Mr. Williams. Congressman, two other. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I want to get quite you right. uh, Congress, Two other points. Uh, one, the foreclosure laws are State laws. And so the if Congress is willing to act to take, take responsibility for what are currently State laws, that would be one thing. A second thing that I would highlight is we are working with both FHFA and Freddie Mac on opportunities to further expand REO opportunities for rental. Mr. DeMarco? Uh, what I was going to you don't get paid as much, but you are welcome to give full answers. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it has been a challenge for me as conservator to look at the, cha the difficulties of the that you are talking about, properties that are unoccupied or where there is a squatter. To Mr. Williams' point, part of the difficulty here is that these are governed by State laws, and there are some States that are, have foreclosure processes and, and foreclosure requirements that are designed to protect the borrower, but at the same token, that is imposing greater losses on the investor in these mortgages because it is such a time-consuming and costly process to move these properties through foreclosure. Even if the property has been abandoned or is a squatter sitting in it, it still in some States is an enormous length of time to move that thing through foreclosure to get that property back into the marketplace to help that local community. And I do believe that that is a problem and it is not being addressed. Well, I am going to be cognizant of I have overused my time even on the second round. But what I will tell you on behalf of this committee is that if you will bring to us, if you will, the bad actors, the ones that you believe, the States that are hurting you, not helping you, and thus hurting the taxpayer, I am a very strong believer in the Tenth Amendment. But when it comes to Federal preemption, look, we hand these States a lot of money. And if we are looking at the various Federal programs that are helping their citizens, we have every right to say this money will not be as available to, and I will take North Carolina, because I have got a member present, North Carolina, we can, we can say, look, this program is not going to be available in North Carolina unless North Carolina gives us the tools to get a reasonable opportunity to, in fact, rehabilitate these. And I would say, for one, even my home state of California, given the choice of not getting the Federal dollars or making changes as to F Freddie and Fannie under, and FHA underwritten homes, they would make changes necessary to help. We have never been asked. And so I would hope that you would really look, use your general counsels, some of those 3,000 hours, and please give to us where the problems are, because we are the committee that happens to also own intergovernment relations. All of those States, all of those cities are, in fact, within our portfolio to try to help them, help you, and help all of us.
So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll have the team follow up with you. I will say the State of California has one of the faster processes, and I believe that's actually helped the certain markets in California to recover better and faster. Thank you. Recognize the ranking member. Just uh, one clarification. The Chairman had asked for agreements um, the, with regard to compensation agreements and certain information. And I just want to make sure that we are talking about um, those executives named in the F S S S S S SEC filings. Is that right? I believe that is what we are talking about. Okay. All but right. if it is more, we will certainly clarify. All right. Um, number two, um, you know, a lot of these, you, you mentioned with regard to those um, law firms dealing with foreclosure. I think you said two two firms had given the rest of them a bad name. Is that what you said? I said a few. Oh, I, said I, a, a I was few, going to say it's a lot more than the no, two. No, I understand. No, I, no, I did oh, not yeah. say two. I said that, that, that a few firms in the industry have given the entire industry a bad name. And what other than changing the um, the lawyer network system, has anything been done to um, bring any kind of punishment to these guys? Let, let me tell you something. In my other life, I used to represent lawyers. And for some of the stuff that these lawyers did, uh, people would be, uh, lawyers would be uh, suspended from the practice of law, if not disbarred. And I find it interesting how we sort of, uh, they keep working for us. And I just don't understand it. I, I'm, and I, I just wonder whether we, underestimate what they have been doing. See, this, this whole robo-signing stuff is we create a, 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 a quote, normal, end of quote, and that is not normal. It is not supposed to be normal. And I could go on and on and on. I was just wondering, has there been any efforts to punish these, these folks? Well, Mr. Cummings, I am not an expert in this, but my general awareness is that this would be something that would be done by, by State Bar Association. Right, that is correct. done in the State. And what has been puzzling to me is I am not aware of hardly any uh, debarment or State disciplinary action that has been taken against law firms. Now, there may be people behind me that know more, but, um, but, but that is in, 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 in their realm. We have certainly been working with State Attorney Generals. Uh, on this on this issue, and as you well know, state attorney generals have been taking an awful close and long look at uh, foreclosure processing issues, both by servicers and by law firms. Did you have something on that, Ms. Williams? I was going to echo that point, uh, Congressman, that we have been cooperating whenever we find these situations with uh, state attorney generals and local counsel on these matters. Did you have something, Mr. Holderman? I have nothing to add. The, um, Last but not least, let me say this. Um, I know that uh, there have been some that said that you all probably felt a little uncomfortable being, being here. Um, but I've got to tell you, um, I, I don't have any sympathy um, because of the people that I face every night when I go home um, in, in my block. In Baltimore, I've got uh, probably in my block out of about 30 houses, seven or eight of them in foreclosure, and those were were my neighbors, and we see it over and over again. I just think that um, I just think that there's more we can we, that we can do. I just believe it, and I really wonder sometimes uh, whether the president even knows how significant this problem is. Um, and I say that with all due respect. Sometimes I wonder whether he, he even he has the information available to understand how many Americans are drowning. Uh, we just had um, NACA in Baltimore, and they tell me some 16,000 people came out trying to get their mortgages modified. 16,000 in four days, and. Uh, so I, I just hope that when you go back to your drawing boards, um, I, you know, I, I kind of wish I could just hang out in the boardroom 
and just whisper in your ears constantly, reminding you of the people who are suffering and who need some urgency, um, and they don't feel like they're getting it. And I know what you're saying, but when you uh, when you got people like the man that I talked to yesterday, who comes home and uh, all the stuff is out on the corner, and it's about Christmas time and Thanksgiving, and he doesn't know where he's going to go. Um, listening to people who make seven million dollars in two years, um, who's supposed to have something to do with his plight and helping him out of it, doesn't give him much relief. You know, he can't afford he can't afford a house. He can't even afford a turkey. So uh, I hope that you'll keep that human element uh, in in mind. And we look forward to, we are going to be meeting with you again, not the committee, uh, but our, our group of, uh, of um, legislators, Mr. DeMarco, okay. hopefully within the next two to three weeks. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. I thank the ranking member. I recognize myself. Um, now, uh, Mr. Williams, I, I ended with you and, and how your uh, deferred compensation is calculated. Um, and I, reading the Politico article on this, uh, it is not clear if it is Fannie or Freddie where this compensation package works this way. So, Mr. Haldeman. So, uh, we have a scorecard uh, which is um, weighted um, into broad categories, broad categories such as uh, um, financial results, uh, mission. Uh, technology and infrastructure, and there are weightings attached to those large uh, categories, and um, they're in the order. They're on the order of four or five of them, and a category weighting is typically uh, twenty to thirty percent. Um, then, and HAMP would be a subpoint under one of those larger categories and there are not weightings attached to a subpoint. So it is a little bit difficult to be too precise about the percentage weighting for just HAMP modifications. But is, a, is one of the broader sections mortgage modifications? It, it would be uh, mission or supporting the housing market, that kind of language. And subpoints under that would have been, would be all of the tools that we have uh, to try to be supportive of the housing market, including what, modifications. What, what other than modifications would be then in that subcategory? Um, it would be uh, refinancings, and within that, HARP refinancings and traditional refinancings. There would be traditional modifications and HAMP modifications. It could be affordable housing goals. Those all could be subpoints. But, but largely, that, that mission that piece is largely modifications? Uh, that would be a, a, a big piece of it, but uh, as a, it, it certainly would be a, a significant piece of it that our that our board would be looking at. And one of the, you know, it's it's not precisely weighted, but because of the attention afforded that in the press, I'm sure that our board looks very closely at the numbers of modifications that are done. So that mission piece, what percentage of your deferred comp compensation comes from that? Your yeah, bonus. I mean, um, I don't recall the precise number, but it would typically, and it does vary from year to year, but it would typically be a number like 25 percent. But you know at the beginning of the year that the board is going to measure you against this scorecard? Yes. Okay. Is that similar uh, for your organization, Mr. Yes, Williams? Yes, it is, Congressman. Okay. And so uh, is it in a similar form as Mr. Haldeman described his scorecard? Is your scorecard similar? I, I have not looked at Freddie Mac's scorecard. But we do have a scorecard. Did, did you, if you listen to the gentleman, I have never Tom, seen the scorecard. Yeah, we, look at, we look at very similar sets of priorities, providing liquidity and stability and support for the market, ensuring that we are doing everything we can to manage credit losses and all the other activities related to, fun, to our financial results that we control, and then also making sure that we continue to address uh, all the improve the operational and risk areas of the company. And are mortgage modifications a part of that uh, scorecard? Yes, they are a part of that. Okay. Is HAMP a part of uh, a part of that as well? HAMP modifications and 
administering the program for Treasury are one piece of the scorecards. Okay. Thank you. That is much more forthcoming than the, the last exchange we had, and I, I appreciate that. Um, Mr. DeMarco, you, you outlined this in your written statement about, uh, about the scorecards, corporate scorecards. Yes. Sir. Um, back in March, the IG said that uh, the FHFA didn't have a, a, a written policy on how to handle that. With your testimony today, it, it sounds like that that is some that critique you have incorporated, and and now there are some solid policies by which to uh, judge these scorecards. To clarify, I've committed to the IG that this will be completed by the end of this calendar year. The work is actively going on now. Okay, that is that the okay. Thank you, and thank you for clarifying. I, and I, I do appreciate that. Now, the, the additional question would be: Will will you make public? Uh, uh, that policy? Um, well, I certainly could. This is uh, what, what the IG was well, the question requesting. Is not, yes. Do or do not. I, I will make it public. Try. I, mean, I will make it public. It is a, it's a written internal procedure for how we would go about the internal review. Okay. Mr. Haldeman, will you make your scorecard public for your institution? Um, I, I can see no reason why we, we it has to be, be able to. But these we, have to be reported in the in the in the in the ten Ks anyway. These are these are publicly disclosed, right? But in a user friendly format, either the the Fannie ten K and it's uh, we have three broad goals. I've now lost it in my stack of paper. Here it is, um, and it's very unclear in the couple of pages in the ten K. Would you make this? Well, if, if I may, I, I will work to make sure that we are, have greater clarity and transparency with regard to the scorecards okay. going I, forward. I appreciate that. But it, since we do have the heads of the two institutions you are overseeing, I, don't, I, I mentioned you as a human shield earlier today. <laughs> um, my intention is not in this questioning for you to throw yourself in front of this questioning. I appreciate your willingness to do this. Um, it is. Uh, a, more of a soldier-like sacrifice. I appreciate it. But with massive losses, you know, we, we want to be able to understand at the beginning of the year how you will be judged and what success looks like. Mr. Haldeman, would you? It is a, a reasonable request, and I am happy to do it subject to the approval of our regulator. We are a regulated organization, and, and uh, I like to check with most things with the regulator before uh, doing it or committing. Nicely done. Who says there is just politics on the Hill? Uh, Mr. Williams? Congressman, we disclose our goals in accordance with the SEC rules. We also disclose in accordance with SEC rules how individuals have performed. We provide the scorecard to Mr. DeMarco, and we will work with him on how he wants to handle okay. this going forward. Okay. Well, you know, Mr. DeMarco has outlined that he would like to see uh, housing finance reform, as would I. Um, and and I have been in Congress since 2005 uh, trying to articulate that, um, and it still has not happened. Uh, the administration has not taken the lead. The President has not taken a lead. The President has uh, complained about executive compensation packages. But in uh, two large entities uh, where he could have a, direct, a larger and direct say, he tends to make speeches rather than actual consultation. Mr. Williams, Mr. Haldeman, there are discussions about uh, Fannie and Freddie's losses going forward. Mr. Williams, at what point will uh, your institution be able to repay the taxpayers for this extraordinary support? Congressman, I, Congressman I'm, I do not venture a time frame in which we would do that. We are very focused on our credit losses. As you have seen probably from the Conservatives report, the activities we have undertaken are reducing future expect, expectations around this area. We will continue to focus on this. But bear in mind, much of what we are dealing with is also driven by the state of the economy, unemployment, in declining home prices. Mr. Williams, uh, Mr. Haldeman. Yes, as you know, um, Congressman, we do pay a 10 percent uh, preferred dividend on our outstanding draw, which for Freddie Mac is now approximately $70 billion. So our annual preferred dividend is $7 billion. And I think the best uh, place to go to get an answer to your question is detailed analysis put out by FHFA, which looks at both enterprises going forward and under different scenarios makes a projection as to the amount of draw that will be required going forward. So you don't have any planning purposes in your institution that outlines when this would happen? 
We do. And the, our what numbers, year would that be? And our numbers and planning were submitted to FHFA and made part of the document that they put out. So you're, you're, you're not willing to say what year it is? I, I can't recall from the document. Okay. And it does, Mr. It does, Williams, what year will Fannie Definitely. have repaid the Treasury? Congressman, as you know, with a 10 percent dividend on the amount that is drawn, we will never fully be able to pay back the amount that is due to the Treasury. This is why the, the Director has highlighted the need to move forward. Mr. DeMarco, what year will the GSEs be able to repay the taxpayers for this extraordinary support? I do not believe they will repay the taxpayer in full. Ever? Well, unless we keep this conservatorship going um, uh, to my children and beyond, um, no. I would hope that the conservatorships end before then. Okay. At what point, uh, Mr. Haldeman wouldn't venture a guess, but at what point will Fan uh, Freddie be able to repay the extraordinary support? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe either company will repay the extraordinary support in full. I have said that before. I mean, I, I just I, I look at the, um, the current financials of the company, the fact that we are shrinking the retained portfolios of the company, uh, looking at the expenses that are there, including the dividend, which is uh, paid to the Treasury Department for that, which is already borrowed. And I don't have a, a timeline looking forward that I can point to and say, by this year, this will be repaid. And I do hope that we have moved beyond the conservatorships. Um, in the relatively near future, so we are not going to get them repaid before then. So if we just left this as it is currently structured, we could be back here having the same hearing in five years? Uh, no, I think we will look quite different in five years. And um, I believe that the book of business that we have been taking on since uh, conservatorship is a profitable book of business to the taxpayer. And I believe that as we uh, finish washing through these bad mortgages that were originated in the 05 to 08 period, that will eventually, we will move past that, and the remaining book of business, the new book of business, will be profitable to the companies. And so I believe that that is one of our fundamental obligations with the companies in conservatorship is to ensure the new business we are doing is profitable. And I believe it is, be? but that is not going to be profitable enough to be repaying this, uh, this amount of money what, in the near what future. What year do you think that would be? Um, I believe our projections, so, well, it is going to depend upon house prices sure, and employment. Sure, it depends on a lot but, of different things. But, but we believe that uh, by the end of next year, we will have moved through a good chunk of most of what is left with the, okay. um, with the right. previous book. Okay. I certainly appreciate it. I appreciate your willingness to answer questions today. Uh, Mr. Marco, I have referred to you as a human shield a number of times. Um, I sit on both financial services and this committee. Uh, you have been very forthright. Uh, we understand the difficult situation that has been thrust upon you. We do appreciate uh, your career of service to the Federal Government. Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Williams, we certainly appreciate your will willingness to head up uh, very challenging institutions. We do. The concern here today is the extraordinary taxpayer support and the fact that, in essence, we have two nationalized entities. I mean, we also have AIG, for instance, but we, uh, we have two nationalized entities here, and that is where your compensation becomes uh, a question of, uh, for the taxpayers. Otherwise, if you are private institutions, we have had these hearings before with private institutions. That is not the proper purview of, uh, of those, me, for instance, that is a taxpayer fiduciary. Um, however, because of the nature of your entities, that is where this concern comes. I, and we understand you are patriotic Americans. We are not questioning your patriotism by any means. Uh, but we are questioning uh, whether or not this is an appropriate type of compensation, level of compensation, uh, with two nationalized entities. Thank you for being here today. I certainly appreciate your willingness and your time. And with that, this committee stands adjourned.